Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the June Mid-Atlantic Council meeting. Uh, normally, we can daydream when we're here because we have a view of the ocean, but we don't have that wonderful view today. Glad to see everyone here. And with that, let's get the first agenda item going. Blue line, tallfish specifications. Anna Hart, whenever you're ready. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just in terms of the presentation today, first we'll go over a little bit of background and the specifications process, um, followed by some information on blue line stock status, uh, recent review of fishery performance, and then we'll go into um, an update on some survey work that we're doing um, this year. <clears throat> and that's something uh, Dr. Morris talked about in past meetings. Um, then we'll go over the advisory panel fishery performance report and then the 2024 SSC and monitoring committee recommendations. Um, just a quick uh, overall objective for today is to review the previously adopted specifications for 2024 and recommend any changes as warranted. So a quick overview, in 2021, the council approved specifications for 2022 through 2024, and that included an ABC of 100,520 pounds. About 73% of the ABC is allocated to the recreational fishery, and the remainder 27% to the commercial fishery. Um, for this fishery, uh, sector-specific annual catch limits are equal to the annual catch targets and the respective um, estimated discards are subtracted from the ACTs to get the sector-specific total allowable landings, or TALs. Um, for the recreational sector, estimated discards are assumed to be about 2% of total landings and about 1% for commercial, the commercial fishery. Um, the commercial fishery for Blue Line is open year-round or until 100% of the TAL is landed, and the trip limit is set at 500 pounds gutted weights um, at the beginning of the year, but then steps down to 300 pounds, which 70% of the TAL is landed. Uh, for the recreational fishery, the season opens starting on May 1st through October 31st, and the trip limit varies depending on mode. So there's a three fish uh, per person limit on private recreational vessels, a five fish per person limit on for higher U.S. Coast Guard uninspected vessels, and a seven fish per person on for higher U.S. Coast Guard inspected vessels. Um, so for blue line stock status, uh, the most recent assessment was conducted um, was the CDR 50 in 2017. This assessment split the stock into a northern and southern region at Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Um, the assessment determined that um, for the stock south of Cape Hatteras, the stock was not overfished and overfishing was not occurring. Um, however, for the stock north of Cape Hatteras, there wasn't enough information to determine stock status. So um, we used a data limited toolkit to estimate the ABC for that region. Um, we did not receive a data update for this year. However, given the limited information available for Blue Line, the data and that would have just uh, been pretty much the information that was uh, reported in that fishery information document. Um, so the next stock assessment for Blue Line will uh, be conducted again through that CDAR process. So the Southeast Fishery Science Center will take the lead there, but we will have representation on that assessment working group. Um, and as of now, we are expecting an operational assessment that will start uh, next year in 2024 and we'll tentatively be available for management in 2025. So to give you a high level summary of the specification process to date, um, as mentioned earlier, uh, the most recent assessment was unable to determine stock status. And so there was no ABC recommendation for that region north of Cape Hatteras. And that region north of Cape Hatteras includes the northernmost boundary of the South Atlantic Council and then our entire region. Um, so a subcommittee of SSC members from both councils, as well as staff from both science centers was developed, and they were tasked with coming up with an ABC for that entire region. Um, and after much consideration, the subcommittee recommended using a data-limited toolkit um, to help develop that ABC. Um, and then that ABC was proportionally split based on the 2017 council-funded pilot tilefish survey. Um, 
And that ABC has remained status quo since that initial development in 2016. Um, then in 2022, uh, the council approved a three-year specification cycle. And just a reminder, 2024 is the last year of that specification cycle. And then in mid-May, the SSC met, as well as the monitoring committee. And then we're here today to review, again, that uh, specification. Uh, so jumping into the commercial fishery performance, uh, landings were low and relatively stable until 2013 through 2015 when landings in New Jersey really drove the initial involvement of the council into the blue line fishery. Um, and since council established management for blue line landings have remained relatively constant with a peak in 2020. Um, this past year, just under 14,000 pounds of blue line were commercially landed, and that is a slight decline compared to last year. Um, and as you can see in that bottom right table, um, the majority of 2022 landings were reported out of New Jersey, Rhode Island, and New York. So the graph on this slide shows annual landings in blue, and then the orange line is the X vessel value, and the dashed gray line represents average price per pound. Uh, since 2000, X vessel value has followed a similar trend as landings, um, with uh, a average at about 61,000 pounds per year. There was a high in 2014 with an ex-vessel value of $560,000 and a low in 2002 at about $651. Looking at price per pound, uh, there seems to be an overall increasing trend since the early 2000s with a peak in 2016 at about $3.50 per pound. Um, in 2022, total ex-vessel value was about $36,000 at about $2.59 per pound. Um, and just to note, all revenue on this slide is um, adjusted for the 2022 dollar to account for inflation. Um, so looking at commercial VTR data, um, the primary gear type reported varies by year, um, but in recent years, bottom long lines, trawls, and hand lines account for the majority of landings. In 2022 specifically, about 55% of landings were reported using bottom trawls and about 37% from bottom longline gear, and the remaining 8% came from hand lines and all other gear types. Um, the map on the right shows our statistical areas in the Northeast region, and looking at landings from 2022-2022, the top five reported statistical areas are in that reddish pink color, and those are primarily off the coast of New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. So now if we look at the current fishing year, um, this figure is pulled directly from the GARFO quota monitoring website. Um, the blue line represents current year landings to date. Um, and as you can see, those are trending above that yellow line, which is uh, last year landing, so 2022 landings, but along that green uh, line, which is that quota rationing trajectory. So basically, if you take the quota and you stretch it equally across the entire year, it follows that trend line. So it, it's following that trend line pretty well so far. Um, and last year, as you can see, the commercial landings did not exceed the commercial quota. So we don't anticipate a need for a pound for pound payback or any of the accountability measures being triggered. So now transitioning into the recreational fishery, um, as many of you know, in August of 2020, uh, private recreational permitting reporting requirements were put into place. Um, these are vessel-based uh, permits, and they are required to submit electronic VTRs. Um, in 2020, that um, what just represents partial year data since those regulations were put in place mid-year. But as you can see, the number of permits have increased since then. Um, a num number of trips has also increased, but there still seems to be this discrepancy between the number of permits issued and the number of trips reported. Um, and just to highlight 2022, we had just under 800 permits issued, about 33 trips reported, and collectively those trips landed 396 blue line tile fish. Um, so this slide shows available, M available MRIP estimates by year and mode. Um, keep in mind that blue line intercepts in MRIP are exceedingly rare events. And so these estimates have a high percent standard error associated with them, as you can see in this table. 
Um, if we look at 2022, Ember uh, estimated landings and just cards combined to be about 85,000 fish for the private rental mode, about 25,000 fish for the charter boats, and seven fish from the, the party boats. Um, and just to draw attention to private rental mode, so MRIP is estimating about 85,000 fish, but then our reporting um, only estimate about 396 fish. So there's quite a difference there. Um, and then if we look at party charter landings uh, through the VTR database, you can see again the difference in values compared to the MRIP uh, year to year. Uh, so in 2022, VTR data represents about 13,000 fish reported um, for combined party charter vessels, and that came from about 236 trips. And that's about a 10,000 fish difference compared to what MRIP suggests. Um, VTR reported uh, discards um, are also shown here, as well as the estimated discards, just so you can see for comparative purposes, and estimate Estimated discards is about 2% of total landings, just as a reminder. Um, so keeping in mind all of the hurdles associated with recreational blue line tilefish data, um, as well as the lack of robust private uh, recreational catch estimates, um, for the past few years, uh, the monitoring committee has recommended using VTR data for party charter fleets, in addition to the Delphi approach which was um, conducted and initially implemented in 2016 to calculate private rental catch. Um, this approach was peer reviewed and accepted as best available science uh, through CDAR 50. And the Delphi approach basically uses a multiplier of 105.16% of the charter VTR catch to estimate private rental catch. Um, so over the years, uh, the monitoring committee has seen this approach as an interim fix um, until more robust private recreational data is collected um, and that you know in the future it might be uh, important to reconsider this approach or, or see if there's a developed approach that may be better. So using the party charter VTR data and the Delphi approach, um, that results in about 17,220 fish being caught in 2022 from uh, the entire recreational fishery. And then if we use um, the estimated pounds, or if we convert that to estimated pounds using the 3.65 pound multiplier, which was the accepted average weight in Amendment 6 to the Tilefish FMP, we get about 62,880 pounds of fish being landed by the recreational sector. And that's about 86% of the total allowable landing. So still under, um, similar to the commercial fishery. Um, so prior to the AP meeting, um, staff has been hearing some uh, feedback about the private recreational blue line tilefish season and suggestions to shift that season back about two weeks. Um, some of the rationale behind this uh, recommendation is because in some areas there's the co-occurrence of blue line and black sea bass, and so better aligning those two seasons will help with um, reducing uh, uh, regulation discards for black sea bass. Um, and the specific recommendation has been uh, to have the blue line season start May 15th and go through November 15th instead of starting May 1st, since that's when the black sea, black sea bass season opens in most states. Um, so based on this feedback, staff looked at for higher VTR data from 2018 through 2022 in states where black sea bass has that start date around May 15th to see kind of what sort of impact this would have. Um, if you look at this first table, um, this shows the number of trips and associated blue line catch with um, reported black sea bass discards um, during those first two weeks of May. Um, so as you can see, there's relatively few trips that take place that um, target blue line as well as catching black sea bass. Um, but most of those trips are catching black sea bass. Um, so like 14 of those trips caught black sea bass as well as blue lines and the total of 17 trips uh, took place. So a large portion of them are catching both fish. Um, and if we look at that proportionally, about 33% of the total catch is black sea bass and all of them are being discarded. 
And then if, for comparative purposes, we looked at the second uh, two weeks of May. Um, and as you can see, the number of trips significantly increases, but that proportion of black sea bass caught um, compared to total catch is about the same at about 37%. Um, so we don't, if, if this season is shift backwards, we don't anticipate it would have a, a large impact on the number of trips being taken as well as the number of blue line caught, but it could save some black sea bass. Um, so for, before getting into the advise, advisory panel feedback, um, I also wanted to provide the group an update on the survey work that we will be expanding northward. Um, this is a South Atlantic deep water longline survey. Um, it's been conducted since uh, 2020. Um, and basically it works with industry participants and it's been operating from the North Carolina, Virginia border down to the Florida Keys. Um, specifically targeting, targeting deep water snapper grouper species, including tilefish. Um, and so the objective of the survey is to generate an indices of abundance for a number of data poor species and collect a variety of biological information to support several stock assessments. Um, so this year, uh, a collective group of folks from the Southeast Fishery Science Center uh, South Carolina and the Mid-Atlantic Council have been talking through ways we can expand this further northward. Um, and we landed on expanding it to about Wilmington Canyon area, so just off of the southern tip of New Jersey. Um, and we expect this sampling effort to start uh, late this summer. Um, the expanded effort will support the collection of blue line tilefish throughout its entire range. Um, and help monitor potential distribution shifts of some of those deep water species. Um, and through this effort, we'll also get additional information on age and reproduction of blue line tilefish. Um, and that's been a research priority for the past several years. Um, and there is additional information if you're interested in learning more about it. Um, that was, I believe on the last council meeting, we had a memo uh, to Chris Moore about it. Um, so getting into advisory panel uh, fishery performance report, we asked the tile fish advisors several questions, and these are the standard questions we ask about all of our species. Um, <clears throat> and some general uh, information about um, factors influencing catch for this year. Uh, so two advisors noted that um, the low quota and trip limits for blue line is really the co constraining effort and landings. Uh, for both commercial and recreational sectors. And that blue line trip limits um, really discourages any sort of directed effort for this fishery. Um, and just to note, this comment has been um, made uh, in several years past and was a trend throughout the entire meeting. Additionally, one advisor expressed that most trips catching blue lines are typically trips targeting other species and incidentally catching blue lines or their multi-species trips targeting both uh, blue lines as well as other deep water species. Um, there were also several comments directed towards the market and economics. Um, one AP member commented that the price of blue line is sufficient to derive commercial effort as seen in landings from 2013 to 2015. Um, however, the low quota and trip limits really hinders this capability. And, and most blue line trips are fill-in trips, or as I mentioned earlier, those multi-species trips. Um, and that directed blue line trips just aren't financially feasible. Um, the same AP member commented that market and economics can't really be considered as a driving force for this fishery due to, again, those constraining quota and trip limits. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, there were other comments about, you know, uh, the, uh, industry participants weren't able to put together directed trips um, and, and similar comments as mentioned. And um, COVID-19 didn't have too much of an impact on this fishery because it's not a directed fishery. Um, there were also several comments directed towards um, the recreational specific issues. Um, one AP member commented that um, when they go recreational fishing, they target both blue line and goldens in um, offshore areas where they are both present. Um, they mentioned that in these areas, they don't see uh, many fishermen. And so there was some concerns about MRIP estimates being drastically higher 
um, and that the only time they really encounter other fishermen is during tuna tournaments. Um, there was uh, the large pelagic survey uh, information also came up during the golden tilefish presentation, um, and an AP member expressed concern using that information for blue line because again, they, they don't think there are too many people participating in this fishery. Um, and then there were comments about recreational effort being limited by total trip cost, um, fuel, bait, and et cetera. Um, there were uh, some of, uh, additional comments about the three fish private recreational bag limits and that discouraging uh, private recreational effort. Um, one uh, individual mentioned that it really discourages, you know, going out targeting tilefish and that it also likely contributes to regulatory discards. Uh, this AP member commented that, you know, if they catch their blue line bag limit early in the day, they're forced to make a decision where they either continue to target other species and if they catch blue line, they have to discard them um, and likely those discards aren't lasting or they have to go in for the day. And he said that can be a frustration because you're, you're going far offshore for these fish. Um, and uh, he said that he has tried using descending devices, but he's not sure how, um, if they work well for blue line specifically. Um, there were also two AP members that spoke in favor of modifying the private recreational season and uh, expressed support for pushing it back two weeks. Um, they think it will um, help reduce regulatory discards as well as um, you know, align those two seasons and control temporal effort for both of the fisheries. Um, some final comments about uh, the recreational fishery. Um, one AP member noted that he uses the EFIN logbook for the species to report his trips, and he wanted to see a question added to that to ask, you know, what other fish people are targeting when fishing for tilefish. Um, the AP member also spoke in support of adding some messaging on the HMS website about the tilefish private recreational reporting requirements, as well as additional outreach efforts to better get the word out. Um, and then just some final AP comments about research priorities. They were um, very supportive of the expanded South Atlantic Deepwater Longline Survey and are looking forward to seeing the outcomes of that work. Um, so for the SSC meeting, um, this group discussed the upcoming Blue Line Tilefish Operational Assessment as well as the expanded South Atlantic Deepwater Longline Survey um, that will be starting next or this year. Um, there were also comments about the need to better understand um, and have a better basis for estimating private recreational catch um, and maybe looking at that Delphi approach again. Um, there was also a uh, some comments about private re recreational reporting rates being very low. And they noted that, you know, over the past three years, there's been almost 2,000 permits issued, but only 75 trips reported, which represents about 799 blue lines. So um, they encouraged efforts to get better information. Um, and then in view of the low catch rates um, by both the commercial and recreational sector and the absence of any measures a relative abundance, the SSC recommended um, continuation of the previously approved ABC of 100,520 pounds for 2024. Um, so at the SSC and monitoring committee meeting, um, there were also comments about um, the large number of commercial incidental tilefish permits issued compared to the number of reported tilefish landings. Um, and this is something that usually comes up with golden tilefish. But given Blue Line was first, we, we figured we'd talk about it now. Um, so staff d dug into this a little bit, and we looked at all of our open um, access commercial permits, looking at the total numbers issued on an annual basis compared to the total number of landings for those given species. Um, and if we look at um, vessel activity, so just looking at those two numbers comparatively, um, it, it seems to be a similar trend across all fisheries, ranging from about 6 to 10%. So it doesn't seem like it's something unique to tilefish. Um, and then blue line or bluefish uh, might be slightly elevated, as you can see, ranging from about 14 to 20%. Um, but 
bluefish is managed across the entire Atlantic coast, so that, that's not too surprising. Um, so getting into the monitoring committee recommendation, um, based on recent fishery performance, the monitoring committee also are, uh, uh, recommended maintaining the previously approved 2024 catch and landing limits. Um, however, given the feedback uh, recently received from staff and at the AP meeting um, and the May VTR data that was presented on a previous slide. Uh, the monitoring, monitoring committee did recommend shifting the recreational blue line season back about two weeks um, and to maintain the, the same length as the, season, as the current season, they recommended May 15th through November 14th. Um, and they don't anticipate this uh, season shift having a large impact on the fishery or its participants. Um, during the monitoring committee, some additional comments came up um, about the private recreational data and performance. Um, this group felt that since we are planning to go through a multi-year specification process um, in the near future, as well as plans for another CDARS assessment, that it would be appropriate to consider additional data sources used to derive that acceptable average weight that um, allows us to convert recreational catch and number of fish to pounds. Um, and maybe reevaluate if 3.65 pounds is the appropriate amount. Um, and then the group also felt it might be time to review that Delphi approach and consider if an alternative method is more appropriate. Um, and then uh, the, the monitoring committee felt that these two things were particularly important since um, you know, a large bulk of uh, the ABC is allocated to the recreational sector. Um, and that brings us to our decision points for today. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we'll have to approve specifications for 2024 and if any uh, changes are warranted. And I just highlighted in italics uh, the monitoring committee recommendations below so you have them for convenience. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Hannah. Are there any questions for Hannah? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I forgot to ask you uh, this the other day, Hannah, when you were telling me, uh, briefing me about uh, Blue Line, when uh, you had the conversations about the Delphi technique, what are the alternatives that folks talked about? Or they just said, we don't like the Delphi technique because it's kind of goofy, you know, in terms of how those estimates were derived, and we just need something else. I think it was more, um, it's been in place for a long time, and with things changing, fisheries changing, maybe catch increasing and maybe more fish being available to our region, it might just be time to review it. Whether we change it or not, um, they weren't really sure and they didn't really have any recommendations on what it should be changed to. They just want to at least talk through maybe what some other options might be. I don't, I don't know, Hannah, if you've ever briefed the council on how that technique is used for blue lines. And maybe if you could just explain it real quickly, just so folks understand what it what it's about, so that you know in the future when we talk about it, they can say, "Yeah, you know, this is a better way to do it." Yeah. So basically, here, if I pull up this, oh no, this table. Um, yeah, this table. Okay. So basically, the Delphi approach. So if you look at this charter numbers of fish, so that that third column. It takes 105%, it adds a 105% multiplier to that number to estimate private rental mode. So 105% of, if we look at 2022, is 3,846 fish. 105% of that is 4,044 fish. So that's the, what is estimated that the private rental mode landed for that given year. And then you sum all, you know, party, charter, and that estimated Delphi approach to get your 17,000 fish for 2022. So it's just a way of estimating what private rental would have been um, since we don't, MRIP is um, maybe not the best use for tile fish. Yeah, and, and the Delphi approach um, years ago, I think it was 2015, there was a group of experts that sat down, discussed what would be appropriate and they came up with this. Michelle Duvall. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just following on that, so would you anticipate gathering a like group of experts? Um, or would, you know, with the monitoring committee suggesting that they would do this or that, you know, the council would convene an expert group to review and potentially update the method in advance of the, the CR assessment? I think that could be a potential path forward. Um, the monitoring committee didn't have any specific recommendations yet. Um, and I think that I would anticipate that would be something we'd talk through come next year. They just kind of flagged it this year of let's let's consider this. Uh, during the next multi-specification setting process. And just one more quick question on the, um, the shift and the start of the recreational fishing year. So, I mean, would that leave any, would that potentially leave a gap, I guess, maybe in regulations at all where there might not be an open season for anything if we shift blue line to align with? Black sea bass. And maybe I'm looking around the table to other folks to just make sure that there wouldn't be a gap in stuff for folks to fish for. It's good to know I asked such a hard question at the beginning of the meeting. Well, Peter, you, oh. or go ahead. Go ahead, Anna. So, I mean, I guess this would maybe be a question for some of the charter captains in here, but um, you know, you could still go out for scup and no. <laughs> uh, well, a, a, yeah, in April, scup would open. Oh no, May 1st, May 1st scup would open. Um, so yeah, well, uh, okay, I'm gonna stop. I know in Delaware, I guess it would be hog would be open up first two weeks. Uh, flounder starting to show up. Uh, Adam, you got some more species? Yeah, so to Michelle's question, and you know what we've seen, I think the theme you've heard, and Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong from any of this, is there is concern in the recreational community that the current bag limits are limiting directed effort on these fish. And given the distance from shore that you have to go, I, it's not something where, okay, summer flounder opens, it's back bay, it's rental boats, it's boats on trailers, it's shore people, it's a big boon to bait and tackle stores. That is not what the blue line recreational tile fish fishery is. So in terms of moving the date to say, oh, this is going to help keep something open to minimize a closed period, I don't really think blue line tile fish, at least in New Jersey, is a gap filler for anybody that's going to keep an industry moving, quite frankly. I, I think the bigger question associated with it is given the potential change that's on the books for 2024 right now in delaying the start of the scup open season to May 1st and a black sea bass season in federal waters not opening to May 15th, I think one could make the argument that having blue line open May 1st to coincide with SCUP may have benefit so that the people who are SCUP fishing have something else to do if they start then. Assuming a typical idea of that a closed season delays effort, a lot of people want to get out and go then when they can, um, there's the potential for that. Now, with regards to that, quite frankly, by May off New Jersey, that's not your offshore scup fishery at any time. You know, our winter scup fishery that was offshore that would cross over with blue line tile fish anglers would be February, March, maybe some of April. So I think that question that I hypothesized on, is there a benefit to keeping the blue line tile fish open May 1st to coincide with scup? I don't really think that's a winning argument, quite frankly, because the scup fishery by May 1st is an inshore fishery, whereas bluefin is offshore. That that was an awful lot. I hope that was helpful uh, to you, uh, Michelle, as well as maybe somebody else in the room. Uh, and if you could add my name to the list for another question after you get through your rest of the list, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Adam. Peter Hughes, you have something to say on this? If not, I'm going to move on. I'm going to grab a couple of the recreational guys. Uh, not on this specific topic, but I, I, I raised my hand on the computer. I didn't. So. 
So go ahead. Yeah, I'll get the others and I'll come back to you. Skip Feller. Yeah, I was just going to echo what Adam said. Well, first of all, scup aren't down here. And, you know, you're talking about a fishery that's 55, 65 miles offshore. So basically you just, you know, all your other stuff, your tog and your flounder, all that's inshore. So you're just basically not going offshore until you can catch, you know, maximize what you're catching with the sea bass mixed in. Scott Lennox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I have to agree with both Skip and Adam. Um, I think the only concern that we would have in our area is some of the charter boats who have recently started to book trips in early May, hoping that tuna fish have showed up. And if the tuna fish have not showed up, then they go blue line tile fishing, knowing that sea bass aren't on the table until May the 15th. This would then take blue line tile fish off the table for those charter boats. So I think they would you know, maybe miss out on some bookings early in the month of May on the hope that tuna fish uh, show up. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Peter Hughes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I put my hand down. So thank I'm you. Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Dewey. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. One uh, about the average weight and, and how long does that change over the last 10 years? Or has it stayed 3.6%? And where did we arrive at that number at? And and I got some a couple other questions. Yeah, so the 3.65 pounds, that came out of um, the Tilefish Amendment 6. Um, it was something that the SSC and Monitoring Committee discussed back then. Um, and it's remained that 3.65 pounds since. So it's it's just a poundage that we use to basically convert since uh, recreational landings are a number of fish. It's just what we use to convert landings to pounds to track it against the um, annual catch limit. So a follow up question would be I understand that the uh, folks decided on that, but where did they come from to decide on that? Me meaning, was there 50 sample sizes, 10 sample sizes? Was it pulled out of the air, flip of a coin? Or, or just what? Where was it? Yeah, I, I don't remember specifically. We can we can look for that uh, information. Uh, but again, here is it's just the fact that uh, one of the SSC members said, uh, when I go out on surveys, I see fish that are larger. So why don't you guys just take a look at that number to be sure that you know it's still appropriate. Uh, one interesting thing that I can tell you is that. Uh, the average weight that we have heard for golden tilefish uh, from uh, recreational and party charter vessels is in the five to six uh, pound range. So relatively, I, I know there are a lot of big golden tilefish out there, no, no doubt, and you see that on pictures, but uh, the five to six range seems reasonable for that. And I don't think that for blue line might be substantially uh, uh, different, but we still have to look at that, and and it's just a matter of j just updating the numbers to be sure that we're not off off base. And my next question would be, uh, with the amount of trips that are being recorded, and the, and the very few fish that are being accounted for. Um, what do we look at that might would change in the future uh, how we're going to do some enhancement of uh, compliance assistance to get something different? We've been into this now, um, I think, three or four years. I might be wrong, three years. And, and, and we're still woefully inadequate. And we talk about uh, folks discarding fish uh, in May, but yet, Discard numbers, are they being reported on their trips that they're catching fish? And if so, we, 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 I mean, it's just a lot of data issues about compliance. And, and something just, you know, I, I'm just wondering how we're going to play catch up because some things are changing a little different. If there is part of the survey that's going to be happening, 
that, that, that would show a, a, a possible trend of abundance or something like that. We're going to have to, uh, uh, the MID's going to have to help out with compliance assistance to get that science level on weights of fish based on sampling uh, in, in the Mid-Atlantic and also uh, folks that are catching them instead of having to go on Facebook or social media and count fish. So I'm just curious of what do we have in the future going forward that we can look at to help enforcement with the, as I used the word, compliance assistance. And we might have to go back and look about uh, this council put into effect, uh, I think when we voted, uh, was to have reporting of the fish before they come off the vessel or, or uh, the boat out of the water. And that gave uh, enforcement an opportunity to, uh, to look at that and, and to enforce the regulations instead of a 24 hour window where you can pull your boat or trailer out and just decide not to report. So, so I'm looking at how we can uh, change things uh, given the need for compliance assistance because there's woefully inadequate the number of permits and the amount of fish being caught. Yeah, so Dewey, that's correct. That was something that this council passed that reporting would be required um, once those fish were landed or as soon as they were landed. Um, that wasn't something that was included in that final rule. Um, I believe um, the agency felt like since uh, for hire gets 24 or 48 hours, as well as commercial, that they would just match that. And I don't know if they would like to speak to that, but um, that is correct. Or, Jose, if you want to add anything. Uh, uh, so the, the other thing that we're doing uh, is we are uh, we're, we continue to work on outreach. Uh, recently, we uh, receive permit information for tau fish permit holders and also HMS permit holders. Uh, Jason, Hannah, uh, Mary, and I have been working on this effort. Uh, we developed some type of uh, outreach, ma outreach materials that we're going to be sending out uh, in the hopes that people that don't understand that they need to report uh, will, do, will do so. Uh, so uh, in addition, we have also talked about uh, some potential outreach where we're going to be contacting uh, state uh, uh, enforcement offices and, and also uh, uh, tackle shops so we can see if they can help us also disseminate this, this information because it's, you're right, it's, it's very important. So we, we're doing as much as we can right now to, to reach out to, to let people know that they have to comply with the, with the reporting. Okay, do oh, I'm, I'm sorry, and one more thing. You were also asking about the weight of, of fish. One thing that came out out of the uh, AP uh, uh, meeting, uh, and I asked this question, is there any way that you, to recreational party charter boats, is there anything that we can do? Can you collect information from us? Can you help us with this? Can we set up a program? And one of the answers that I got is that it's too much, too much work, but we're still gonna try to, I still have to talk to uh, Chris Moore, and people from the Northeast Fishery Science Center and see if there is a way that a program can be developed where we can get better information on fish, the size of the fish that are being landed by party charter vessels. So that's in, in our uh, mind as well. Good doing. How about, uh, and I probably should know this, but I don't know if I should know it or not, but the permit that's put out recreational does it say on there that you have to report? So, so if that's already on that piece of paper that they're signing or getting, that's pretty much uh, pretty good enough that they know they have to report, correct? The information is there. Uh, do people read all the fine print? I don't know. Uh, I, I just think that we still have to make a a, a, an effort to, to reach out to those individuals and see if through this effort we see some type of change in the in the numbers of fish that are being reported. 
I don't see G Caleb Gilbert on here, but I, has there any been anybody ever been written up yet as far as not filing or not reporting the fish? So I'm not sure, sure about reporting, but I believe Caleb said it was either our last meeting or two meetings ago that they did have someone that they pulled over that didn't have a permit um, and that, that they had the conversation with them. And I don't know what the outcome was, if a citation was issued or anything like that, but they did pull someone over and let them know that they needed a permit. But I'm not sure about the reporting. All right, thank you. Adam Nawalski. So just building on this same topic, I'll just say that I am a tile fish permit holder and I've never reported a tile fish since I've had the permit and I haven't caught one. So I'm not one of the people that needs the compliance assistance today. Um, but I don't disagree with the fact that there are concerns. And one idea I had would be to reach out to those permit holders that have never landed a fish. For example, myself, what is the issue here? Has, so, has there, so to start that conversation, there's two questions. Number one, has there been an analysis done that takes a look at the permits that have been issued and those trips that have reported landings on those permits. Is it the same eight or 10 permits that are reporting fish every year or is it a, a variety? I think that would be a first place to look. Are we just getting reporting from the same fixed number of people? And then based on that, I would offer what can we do to reach out to those people that have not reported either through the council or through GARFO to try to get some information about why there's no reporting going on. Is it because they're not catching fish? Is it lack of knowledge? Is it just compliance assistance needed? Anna. Just to answer the question about, is it the same people reporting year to year? There is quite a bit of overlap of, you know, say five anglers or a couple of anglers year to year, but then there are a couple new ones um, that popped up in 2022 and in 2021. Adam? So while we're here, is there anything we could do to get more information from those permit holders that have not reported a trip with landings, either through the council or through GARFA? Go ahead, Anna. So I like, do you mean call them and have a conversation with them or email them? We do have their contact information, so we do have the ways to contact them. I would think individual phone calls to 800 participants is probably not terribly efficient. Um, but hey, if staff has time, go for it. Um, I think we would probably want to develop something a little more efficient, uh, some survey. You know, what I'm looking for is who would be responsible for initiating that? Do we need to have some positive, on the record, actionable item by this council here today? Can staff just walk away and say, we're gonna think of some ways to reach out to these people, either through survey, either through just cold calling a small subset of them? Does the service have something similar that they've applied in other fisheries, uh, in other regions that they could apply for trying to get this information? You know, I don't want to leave this room. We, we've had, Dewey's asked this question. Many of us have asked this question and over and over and over. We're three years into the program now. We see what's happening. Let's not walk out of here not doing something proactive is my sense. Anna? So I can't speak on behalf of the service, but um, at the October council meeting last year, we had this discussion um, and staff took that as um, we need to do additional outreach. So as Jose said, we have contact information from all the current pile fish permit holders as well as HMS permit holders. Um, since we've heard from you know, our AP members and stuff that every HMS permit holder is a pot potential tile fish uh, fisherman. So we have plans of contacting them. Uh, we've been putting together an email and a flyer that we plan to send out to them. Um, and we took all the feedback that we got in October and are trying to implement that uh, for this year. Go ahead, do it. 
you yeah, one last thing. Uh, about eight, August the 10th of this year, I'll be offering my services to y'all to 100 people to go uh, uh, contact them by whichever methodology y'all approve under the confidentiality of conflict. And, and, and so uh, uh, I'll reach out to y'all in August and, and I'll, I'll help help with that any way possible. I'll offer my services free of charge. All right, we only need what, 1,300 more then? Or 13 more people to do that? Joe Cimino. Thanks, Richard. Um, I think I might still have a question. So I, I, I support monitoring committee recommendations, but one more question on the Delphi method then. We, we talked about the, well, that percentage, which I'm assuming at the time was a proportion of catch, estimate, assumed catch between the two. So that would be changing over time, right? So there, one of the suggestions may just be to revisit the dynamics within the fleet to see if that proportion has changed, right? Okay, so yeah, I mean, I think that's something we should be doing every five years or so and just put a number to it, but certainly support re-looking at it. Thanks. Paul Rego. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a comment on the, um, uh, in the compliance assistance aspect of this. One of the things that the SSC did recommend was some um, a more formal analysis. And one venue for that might be MRIP itself, uh, since uh, they would be in the best position to conduct a, a valid survey. Uh, and then two, uh, they would also be interested or could be interested in this as if this approach becomes a basis for other fisheries around the country. So um, I, I think their interests should align fairly closely with those of the council on this matter. Thank you. Any more questions, comments for Hannah? Nothing around the table. Anyone? From the audience. James Fletcher, go ahead. Can't hear you, James. Stephen, is he muted on his end? Go ahead and try it again, James. We still can't hear you, James, so we're going to move on. One more time. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, when we put in the commercial permit requirement and reporting, why don't we use the same method for tilefish? We had mandatory reporting with notice or notices of violation if you didn't have the permit and if you didn't have the log books. Why or is, this, is the council dancing three years later and not requiring mandatory reporting. And Bluefin data has the system, we'll put it in. So my question is why we're not doing it. It goes mainly to National Marine Fisheries. Why do we have two separate ways of enforcement for recreational or as I call them, the prestigious elite and commercial? Where's the difference? Thank you. Mike? The biggest difference is that we have two sources of data for commercial fisheries. We have commercial VTRs that are submitted for every trip, and we have dealer landing reports that are submitted for every trip. That gives us the ability to match every trip 
from a dealer report to a vessel trip report. When there's a missing vessel trip report, we have a mechanism to say, well, we have evidence that you landed fish to this dealer on this day, where is your vessel trip report? With the recreational sector, we don't have any way to cross-reference trips. As Adam said, he has the permit, but he's never landed tilefish, so he hasn't reported it. It's impossible to determine what percentage of vessels that have the permit simply haven't landed tilefish and therefore are not reporting versus the ones that have the permit and have landed tilefish but have failed to report. James, do you have a follow up? Follow up. On that Bluefin data app, there is a provision that before you go to sea and report, then it can remind you to report when you come back. So just like we have the dealer and the vessel reporting, the Bluefin data app gives you who went out and whether they reported. So it's the same. Just need to look at Bluefin Data's app and not use it as an excuse. You can it double checks itself. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I believe Laurie Nolan. Hey Wes, can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, good. Nice to hear your voice. Um, I just. I uh, have one more thing to add on the Delphi approach as far as um, it, the way the split landed it, as far as rec and commercial went. I know that was um, a big issue, a big blow to the commercial fleet. And now once you're locked into regulations, um, the idea that the split could could be adjusted is hard to justify down the road. So I wonder, if in reviewing the Delphi approach, is there any review of the actual split between the commercial and the recreational sectors where that could possibly be adjusted as an outcome of a review? Anna? Uh, I, I think that would have to be a more a, a review beyond the Delphi approach. I think reviewing the Delphi approach is just looking at um, private rental that that modes landings since we don't have a good understanding of what it is um you know mrip is not the best for it so the recommendation has just been to review that particularly um if throughout that review we think that the split is not appropriate at this time i i, I think that would be a whole separate conversation Thanks, Hannah. That's what I thought. I just was wondering if um, if I, uh, if there would be a review on that. But OK, thanks. Thank you, Lauren. Any more questions, comments? Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So kind of circling back to Adam's question of, you know, something actionable so you all are working to you know develop these outreach materials and contact folks who have the permit and like um overlap between hms permit holders and tilefish permit holders and I, I feel like i might have mentioned this before when we had this conversation but i don't know if there's the potential for you know folks who have registered for you know, the EFIN logbook that the council developed or who, you know, are using, you know, Safest eTrips mobile to report to get some kind of push notification or something like that, that just might be a, hey, have you reported your tilefish lately? You know, something to just jolt people or, you know, and, and you know, for folks who are maybe not using like the mobile version of um, eTrips, but, you know, if they're just logging in via the website, maybe, you know, there's some email that comes to their account. I don't know, but that's another another thought to try to prompt some compliance. Thank you, Michelle. I believe that we have a draft motion that Skip would like to make. 
Got a ready hand. Would you like to read into the minute, please? I uh, move to revise the recreational blue line tilefish season from May 1st through October 31st to May 15th through November 14th, starting in 2024. Do we have a second on a motion? Ken Neal seconds it. Mike Benny. I guess I have a procedural question. What's the action that would do this? Check with Chris, but I think we need some form of framework adjustment or something to do do this. I don't have a problem with the intent of the motion. I think we need to be clear on, on how this would actually get done. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hannah, I think you had conversations with Garfo staff about this. Want to address it? I, I think I know the answer, but I let, let you do that. Yeah, I believe this is something we can do through our specification process um, and just do. Chris. Yeah, so I think that's the answer, my specifications in the specification process. Are you thinking about another document that we need other documents or other process to uh, make the change? So the, the agenda item for today is is review the 2024 Blue Line Tile specifications. And I believe the action that was intended was a rollover of the specification. And then treating the season separately. If there's a if the if that's different, if, if the actual action would be the council to submit revised specifications for 2024 with a different season, I think that's what I'm that's what we need clarification on. Yeah. So basically, it would maintain um, the ABC and the catch and landing limits, but then have a modified season roped into that. So it'd be a a, a new specification. It'd be Maintaining the same catch and landing limits, but adding that new season. So it's it's a new specification going through that new process. So amending that specification, but it's only amending the season. Is that Mike, okay with that? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm okay with that. for clarification from staff because because staff were under the understanding that we were not doing new specs for 2024, but that there would be a potential framework adjustment to change the season i think that could be another approach that we do um that's not the way it was framed at the monitoring committee meeting there's more hey, mr chair so i'm i'm a little confused about the conversation i assumed anna that you had this conversation with garfo staff so i thought we had this resolved but if in fact you are not well let me put it this way there's a better way to do this, a quicker way to do this, then let's do it. So if there, if we want to handle this by framework, timing still works, then we'll do it by framework. I thought, again, that this was resolved, that specification submitting an additional, or submitting another specification package, change the season was the most efficient, effective way to deal with this. But if that's not true, then we probably need to hear that today. That was my understanding that that would be the easiest approach. Okay, Chris. So without any additional comment, that's our plan. All right. Uh, Skip, would you like any rationale on your motion? Just to, we're trying to line up the, the sea bass and blue line tile fish to lessen the discards on the sea bass.
Any additional comment on the motion? Yeah, ladies and gentlemen. Adam? Is there any benefit since we're not sure we can do this to include something that we're not sure we can do this through specifications? Is there any benefit to including something in this motion that would say our intent is to do this through specifications, but if not, then treat this as an initiation of a framework adjustment so that we don't have to initiate that at our next meeting that it could de facto be that initiation if we can't do that through specification. Chris? So given the conversation we've had, that's on the record. Again, I would ask GARPO, is there anything in addition to what we've talked about that they'd like to add? Because it would be nice to know that in fact, we're going down the wrong path. Not hearing anything going down a specification path. However, conversation we've had suggests that if something happens after this meeting, visit it, that we have to deal with the framework. That's, those are the only two options that I've heard. So again, we're on the specification path. Unless GARPO says differently, that's what we're gonna do. Anna? Um, I think the way this motion is written, I think it would give us the flexibility um, based on what you're saying, Adam, to do either approach if it comes to it. Michelle Duvall. Just a process question. So I'm guessing or assuming that the way that we thought this would happen would be through like, what is it that like supplemental information report or something? Like that would be the way that this would move forward. Okay, thank you. Mike Benning. Sorry, there's just there's two aspects. A yes to the SIR, but that would be whether that's the that addresses NEPA. That addresses the National Environmental Policy Act requirement if we're changing the action. That would be true whether we're doing this as a framework adjustment or a revised specifications document. So there's still some lack of clarity about whether we're doing this as a revised specs package or we need to do a framework adjustment. Um, but it, in either case, the NEPA requirement could be satisfied through a SIR. Um, and you know, I wish I, I could be defi more definitive. It's just that we walked into this meeting thinking that what we were gonna be entertaining was a standalone framework adjustment to deal with the, the season change, not revised specs. So um, we'll have to take a look at that and, and hopefully we can get this wrapped up and you know, resolved pretty quickly. All right, I think we've had enough discussion. Um, let's go ahead and take a vote. Please raise your hand on the computer and give us a minute to get the votes counted. All in favor, raise your hand. All right, we have 16 in favor. Everybody, please lower your hands. All opposed, raise your hand. I see none. Any abstentions? One. Motion passes 16, zero to one. Anna, do you have anything else to bring before us? Thank you very much.
the whole process thing just didn't know if we need to mirror 2023 with 2024 specifications or if that's an automatic rollover. So it sounds like it's an automatic rollover. We don't need a motion. Right. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. We know of one thing and that's it. Is that one one roll? All right, with that, let's go on to our next agenda item, the 2024 Golden Tallfish Specifications. Jose, are you ready? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So basically, we're going to do uh, the same thing that you just did for uh, Blue Line Tallfish. You're going to review the uh, and if necessary, revise the 2024 uh, uh, specs. And we're going to basically discuss the same type of information that Hannah just presented, but uh, for golden tilefish. So the 2021 management track assessment indicated that the stock was not overfished and overfishing was not occurring in 2020. Uh, fishing mortality rate was 39% uh, below the threshold, and the SSB was 96% uh, of the biomass target. In addition, that uh, management track assessment indicated that there was evidence of a stronger than average year class uh, in 2017. Here you have information that comes from the uh, data update that was produced by Paul Nischke at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. And on the left, you have the catch per unit effort for uh, alfish. And you can see in 2022, there was a decrease in the catch per unit effort relative to the 2020 uh, peak as the year, as the 2013 year class appears to be aging out of the commercial uh, fishery. <clears throat> On the right uh, bubble plot, you can also see how that 2013 year class keeps on tracking through all the different market size um, categories. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the 2021 management uh, 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 Track assessment, as I said before, indicated that that 2017 year class was uh, above average. And we cannot really say much about how strong that is until we do the 2024 uh, 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 research uh, track assessment. W one thing that you can see is that small decrease in catch per unit effort in the last two years probably indicates that the 2017 year class is not as strong as the uh, 2013. But again, the reductions in uh, 2021 and 2022 on that catch per unit effort is a lot smaller than what we have, what we have seen in, in prior years. So uh, still the 2017 uh, year class is uh, relatively strong. So we're in the last year of our specifications uh, cycle. And similarly to uh, uh, Blue Line Talfish, the SSC met and the monitoring committee, and they provided recommendations. Now the council is going to be making uh, their recommendations for next year as well. The management track assessment that was uh, produced in 2021 is what you what we use to develop the current specifications. And next year, we're going to have a research track assessment, as I indicated before. And that's what you're going to use to develop the next specifications uh, cycle. So here we have landings and, 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 and quotas for the last uh, seven years in that red box. And on average, landings have uh, uh, tabulated at 1.55 million pounds, and the average quota is 1.7 million pounds. So about 91% of the overall quota has been harvested. The last two years, in 2021, 93% of the quota was harvested, and in 2022, 91%. So the bulk of the quota uh, is being landed for this fishery. The primary type of gear that is used to uh, harvest uh, uh, tilefish is long line. The bulk, the bulk of the landings come from that uh, gear type. And statistical areas 616 and 537 continue to be the two most important uh, 
statistical uh, areas as far as uh, extraction of the uh, golden tile fish. In 2022, now this is landed weight, 1.4 million pounds were uh, landed and the ex vessel revenue was $6.5 million. Uh, and this generated a mean price per pound of $4.72 in 2022. This is, uh, comes from uh, Garfo from the uh, weekly quota monitoring uh, report. And this landings here, uh, incidental landings are as of May 31st. And the blue line shows the landings for this year. The yellow line shows the landings for uh, last year. And you can see that as of May 31st, we're slightly ahead of the landings uh, when compared to last year landings for the same time period. And about 10,000 pounds have been landed incidentally. This is about 14% of, of the quota. But we're still below that green line that is the quota ration, rationing uh, trajectory. <clears throat> this table shows the incidental landings and quotas for the last uh, few years. And you can see that uh, the last three years, the incidental landings have tapped at about 36% of the of the quota, so relatively stable there. So typically, there are no well, there are no commercial discards of of golden tilefish in in directed trips, and there is a question mark there because that's typically how we uh, uh, assume that the landings were because there is no discards in golden tilefish. All the fish that is landed needs to be uh, kept. But recently, uh, as the working group working with the uh, uh, produced the next uh, research uh, track assessment, we realized that some of the landings are coming from the uh, directed uh, fishery. I mean, discards, excuse me, but they're minor discards. And it's typically because when they're pulling the fish out, there might be a fish that is lost or a fish that is damaged because it has been eaten by another animal or whatnot. <clears throat> So next time we're going to be deducting, when we do the next uh, uh, quota uh, uh, setting, we're going to be deducting a very small proportion of the landings from the directed fishery, but it's almost insignificant. But we're going to make the adjustments where they're supposed to be made from, from now on. In addition, uh, commercial discards were, has never been included in the assessment. They were never included before. But we're adjusting the quota for those uh, uh, commercial discards. And typically, as I said before, it was for the uh, indirect, uh, indirect uh, fishery. Uh, uh, but this year, uh, we're planning on adding uh, discards to the data that goes into the assessment, because we have uh, uh, better information about that. <clears throat> These are the commercial uh, discard trends that we have used for the last few years. Uh, so for 2016 to 2020, the, the incidental quota was adjusted down by 17,500 pounds because of those uh, incidental uh, discards. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to update this for 2017 to 2021 because there was no information on discard estimation, precision, and sample size analysis. That is the document that I used to update this. Now, one thing that I can tell you is that the working group, uh, Paul Ninschke, look at uh, discards from uh, uh, dealer data and from the observer program. And the discards that I know that we're not comparing apples to apples, but the discards that were uh, tabulated came at 6.6 .6 metric tons or about uh, 14,700 pounds or so. So you can see that discards keep on you know, they're about the same, about the same value. So we don't think that that's an, uh, an issue there. Uh, in 2022, there were 55 dealers that bought $6.5 million worth of golden tile fish from uh, 118 vessels. And most of the dealers are located in New York, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Not a, just, just the same type of, uh, just the same locations that we typically see uh, every year. 
Now, regarding the recreational fishery, I'm going to show you some uh, National Marine Fisheries Service recreational statistics, and they show that landings from 82 to 2022 period, they range from zero for most years to about 200,000 fish in, in 20, 2010. That was the largest amount. And then in 2022, uh, landings were uh, tabulated at about uh, 100,000 100, uh, uh, 100, fish or so. But just like uh, uh, you can see from these PSCs that they're very, very large. Also, there are a lot of years where you have uh, zero uh, landings. So we don't think that uh, MRIP is, 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 is a good data source to, to, or, or information to tabulate uh, party charter, uh, private rental uh, uh, landings for gold in tilefish because it's a rare event species. Now, regarding DTR, here on the left, you have uh, uh, fish landed by party, uh, party charter vessels. And in 2022, about uh, 5,700 fish were uh, reported landed. And that's about a 17% decrease from the prior year of about 1,100 fish or so. On the right, we have uh, landings by the uh, private uh, sector. And, uh, and you can see that there is a, a, a small increase in landings from year to year, but we already talked quite a bit about how this, uh, uh, we need to do additional effort to see if we can improve the uh, landings from this uh, specific uh, sector of the uh, recreational fishery. Now, this is something that I have never shown you uh, before. This is uh, recreational uh, landings that come from the large pelagic uh, survey. This is something that the working group has been looking at uh, carefully. Uh, because we're trying to include uh, recreational landings in the uh, stock assessment. This is something that has never been done before. Here you have pile fish landings in number of fish. This is for charter mode. And you can see that there are quite a bit of landings there for golden tile fish, blue line, unclassified tile fish, and, and so on. This table here now shows you the landings for the private uh, mode, uh, the LPS. So, uh, and again, we don't have to spend too much time on this today, but uh, the working group uh, decided to use the private mode landings from the LPS to supplement the information that is gonna be put into, into the stock assessment. We think that this, and you can see that this numbers here are uh, substantially higher than the numbers that are being reported under the uh, BTR uh, system. Now, regarding, regarding the surveys, uh, uh, there's gonna be another uh, golden tilefish uh, uh, independent bottom long line survey that is gonna take place this year uh, in June, uh, July. And this, the purpose of this is, is to basically uh, extend the time series to derive an index of abundance for the stock and to collect additional biological information to support the understanding of the stock and, and the stock assessment. Now, this will be the second year of a direct golden tilefish survey in addition to the pilot survey that we had in uh, 2017. So we're very excited about this. Then Hannah covered this already about the South Atlantic Deep Water Long Line Survey. I'm gonna skip this. Now I'm gonna move into discussing the advisory panel um, uh, 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 fishery um, uh, report. And the industry indicated that they are experiencing market, uh, market issues in New York uh, and this is something that is happening since the Fulton market moved to the new location in Hunts Point, which has resulted in some uh, loss in business. So this is something that has been happening uh, for a while. Uh, COVID-19 has also impacted the way of how uh, businesses uh, is, 
are conduct how business is conducted. They indicated that sales are down and they're having a very difficult time collecting collecting uh, money uh, as well. So even though things look better, the industry still is not working at full uh, capacity and the market cannot handle too much volume of tilefish uh, as prices uh, decrease uh, drastically. Regarding environmental conditions, they continue to indicate that windy con conditions impact fishing. Uh, it's very difficult to come up with uh, timing of fishing trips and the du duration of fishing trips, especially when uh, weather, weather patterns uh, change uh, drastically. Uh, you know, if they don't have a steady, they have too much uh, uh, wave action is, is, is a problem for this uh, fishery. In addition, they, uh, some of the advisory panel members indicated that the MRIP data uh, not to be used as a tool for management uh, or stock assessment purposes. And, and some of the advisory panel members also indicated that they had concerns about the LPS estimates, especially the fact that they're, uh, you know, 10 times higher than, than those that uh, we're getting under the current system that uh, was recently uh, implemented by the service. Regarding uh, general fishing traps, uh, uh, they indicated that effort has been consistent as far as days at sea, and more fish is being landed with the same uh, effort. A large amount of extra small fish uh, were pressing in 2022 compared to prior years, and those are uh, fish of less than two pounds. And you do see a little bump in the number in that bubble graph plot that I just showed you. There was a small bump there in the in the amount of extra small fish that were landed in 20. 2022 compared to uh, 2021, so that's 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 a good a good sign. They indicated that they uh, support the effort of council staff uh, uh, with the outreach efforts uh, to uh, to address the reporting uh, issue, and they think that this is something that we need to continue to do. Uh, the for hire effort was reduced in 2020, uh, 2021, and 2022, and they indicated that worse trip bookings, uh, they saw worse trip bookings in 2022 compared to 2021, and they're expecting even worse trip bookings in 2022 than uh, 2023 than 22 and 21. Slightly better than during COVID, but they're not very ho hopeful of, of a, a lot of activity. It was also a concern over the lack of biological sampling uh, as the dog and, and the council has talked about this uh, quite a bit uh, in, in prior uh, meetings. Uh, some AP members indicated that, uh, you know, there's, we need to maintain the, the current biological sampling or, or increase that. And they offer a few suggestions of how this could potentially, or some avenues to potentially uh, tackle this. They indicated, you know, could it be possible to uh, to incorporate biological sampling, uh, a biological sampling program into the observer uh, efforts, uh, or if it is possible to start a new database for biological sampling? Obviously, all of these things have uh, uh, trickle uh, effects, and and there are a lot of logistics uh, that will go into something like this. But these are some suggestions that they uh, recommended. Now, the SSC met uh, last month, and they did not make any changes to the previously recommended ABCs for 2024. They indicated that the population of uh, golden tail fish generally appears to be at, 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 to be at equilibrium, that the fishery seems to be very stable, in addition, we have the two long line tile fish surveys and the research track assessment that is coming uh, is going to be uh, done in 2024. And this will provide a comprehensive uh, summary of the stock conditions and improve the basics for future ca catch limits. So they recommended to keep things as they are right now because we're going to have uh, quite a bit of additional information in 2024 to set our next. Uh, uh, specifications uh, cycle. 
They also indicated that there is a continued need to improve uh, pore sampling, just as the AP uh, members indicated. Uh, one comment that was made during the SSC uh, meeting was the, the, one of the uh, SSC members it noted, noted that the reductions for management uncertainty for the commercial fishery seems to be very small. And this is something that was further addressed by the monitoring committee meeting, uh, the monitoring committee. So I will talk about that in, in just a few minutes. In addition, there was a, a, a comment over, uh, again over the number of tile fish uh, incidental uh, permits and, and, and the participation, and Hannah covered that very well in, in her discussion, so I'm going to skip this. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about the monitoring committee recommendations. Uh, again, the monitoring committee review all the available information, and they indicated that management uncertainty uh, seems to be appropriate for this uh, small IFQ uh, fishery. Just as a refresher, refresher, management uncertainty is comprised of two parts, uncertainty in the ability of management managers to control catch and uncertainty in quantifying the, tr the true catch. So it, it, management uncertainty can occur because of lack of sufficient information about catch due to late reporting, under-reporting, misreporting uh, land, of landings and discards and so on or because of a lack of management precision. So the monitoring committee feels that in this very small IFQ fishery, this, uh, this uncertainty is, is, is uh, non -ex very, very low. So the monitoring committee did not make changes to their previously recommended catch and landings limits or other, other management measures for 2024. No changes to the back limits were recommended and no changes to the incidental uh, 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 incidental uh, poundage is uh, also was also recommended. Now there was a memo with uh, staff recommendations to uh, Chris Moore, and that memo in the staff memo indicated that based on the uh, review of recent fishery trends and other available information, the staff recommended no changes to the 2024. Uh, Specification. So this is just a recap of of what's uh, on the books right now, and 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 basically the IFQ will fishery will have a quota of 1.8 million pounds, and the incidental fishery will have a quota of 50 75 uh, 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 thousand uh, thousand pounds. And that basically concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair. If you have any. Uh, questions I will address them now. Thank you, Jose. Any questions? Chris Pat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the uh, presentation, Jose. Uh, in the fishery performance report, the uh, for hire captains on the AP um, uh, thought that trips would be down this year uh, compared to the last uh, couple. Did uh, they give any um, reasons why they think that's uh, that's going to occur? Well, there, there, there are two components there. Uh, one of them is the number of trips that they book versus the number of trips that they actually take given weather conditions and giving some uh, you know other things that are environmental things out of out of their control so that's one of the things that you know th that that's one of the things that will not allow them to go out and fish all the all their uh, trips that have been booked but i think that in general terms it was the economy the economy is one of the things that there's still is still that issue there with that still reminiscent from uh, COVID-19 seems to be, and not just for the party charter, but also for the commercial fishery. So things are a little bit better, but not as good as they would like to see them. Any more questions or comments around the table? Questions from the audience? Please come up, state your name, and any organization that you represent. Yep, right here in the middle.
just push the red button. Button right in the middle, it'll turn red. Um, um, yes, my name is uh, Julie Evans. I'm the Fisheries uh, Advisory Council from East Hampton representative here today for the first time meeting you all. Listen to you on on the on the Zoom meetings for a couple of years. Um, Mike, I have a simple question. I just didn't get the numbers um, Jose was saying about um, the quotas. Recreational, if you could repeat that for me, that's all I wanted to know. So basically, the if the council doesn't make any changes today, the quota will stay at the same levels that were uh, we had last year. So for the IFQ fishery will be 1.763 million pounds. Um, for the incidental fishery, it will be 75,410 pounds. Welcome to your first meeting, we're glad you're here. Laurie Nolan. Hi, thanks. Um, I just was looking for a clarification um, with Jose on the catch disposition discard trends. Um, I didn't get to see the number, Jose, what, what number slide it was, but it was your title was catch disposition slash discard trends. Okay. Um, so yeah. Yep. Yeah, this one. So I just, I, I don't know if I didn't hear you right or, or I just wanted to clarify um, and understand that to date we have been deducting the trawl discard estimates on the flow charts. And now futuristically, the plan would be to account for those damaged fish. Um, whether they're eaten by the crabs or damaged because a shark ate half of them, those discards that occur in the long line fishery will be added to the flow chart after the track assessment. I think the research track assessment in 2024, all of this will be identified, clarified, and you will have a deduction on the ITQ side for those damaged fish that get discarded is is that correct so the, the way this works here this uh the discards trends that you're seeing here this is a publication that is produced by the service and this is basically on observer uh trips so we know where these numbers are coming from uh, the discards in the fish are relatively low, as you can see there. But one of the things that we have done in the past is that all the discards were, uh, were deducted from the incidental fishery because we thought that that was the only fishery that was producing uh, discards. The reason we thought that is because basically the golden tail fish fishery, there is no, there is no high grading. You're not allowed to to throw fish back. Therefore, we were assuming that all the discards were from the incidental fishery. Uh, the working group has been looking at this a, 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 a little bit closer, and we realized that there was some discard that was attributed to the long line fishery. And gotcha. the only, the only uh, and to other troll, small mesh, large, me large mesh, and so on, and gill net, or, some other some other gear type. So there is a very small proportion of the discards that are coming from the directed fishery. And this can be, you know, Paul did a little bit more more work and we thought about this a little bit more. And it seems to be that in some of those streets where you have observers, you know, they see fish going overboard. It might not be on purpose, it might be just a fish that just slipped or or a fish that comes out. And, and, and the tail is gone because somebody, something else ate, ate half of the fish and that fish is thrown back, that's considered discard. So from now on, what we're gonna do is we're gonna allocate 
the proportion of the discards that are coming from the incidental fishery to the incidental fishery to derive the incidental quota and the small proportion of discards that is coming from the long line fishery we're going to attribute that to the golden tilefish ifq uh, fishery to come up with the ifq quota now again uh i, I don't have forget the, the number, but it was like 1.5 metric tons or so, it's, it's a very small amount. Now, right. of course, you, you have an observer and all that data is being spanked, but, but my, my sense is that this will be, I mean, a rounding error for, for, for the final quota of the IFQ fishery, unless things were to change regarding how much fish is being discarded by that sector. Right. So it actually will get teased out of these numbers we're looking at. It's right now the long line discard is included within these numbers in this presentation. So they're basically going to tease out any damaged fish that were a discard in the long line fishery will be teased out of these numbers and then in the flow chart be placed under the ITQ and have them be accountable for it. That's correct, Lorraine. However, it's, it's however it's not going to be these numbers. There are going to be new numbers. Right. Right. Different camps. Okay. Okay. I just uh, so it so technically though all the discards have been accounted for um, in all these years since this data since the catch disposition was presented. So the discards have been accounted for since 2012. It's just now we're going to even clarify it a little further and pull the long line discards out of these numbers. So the total number won't change. It's just, there'll be a deduction in the ITQ column also. That's correct. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jose. And I just figured I'd put a date on the survey. It's June 18th. That's when the survey is gonna start, just so everybody knows. Thank you, Lori. Any more questions, comments? You have no action that needs to be done at this time, Jose. Anything else? Oh, nope, that's it. All right, Chris Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to take a break. So, give me one second. All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, let's take a break till three o'clock, and then we'll come back. But Chris has an announcement first. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, the folks that are going uh, to uh, on the trip tonight with Skip, Skip's Hospitality, uh, if you want, you don't have to, but if you want to, see Mary now to cover that payment instead of waiting until you get on the boat. But uh, again, it's up to you. Thank you.
Hey, Jason, go ahead if you want to test your audio. Hey there, how do I sound? You sound good. Okay, thanks. Give everybody about a one minute warning. One minute, we're going to start back. Welcome back from break, everyone. Let's get started with our next agenda item, unmanaged commercial landings report. Julie Beatty, whenever you're ready. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have a presentation today on the annual update of unmanaged commercial landings, which is something that the council requested as a follow on action to the unmanaged forage omnibus amendment. And the intent of this report is to look for signs of developing unmanaged commercial fisheries and then decide if any further evaluation is needed or if um, any consideration might be needed for a potential management action. But this is really meant to be just a high level first look at things um, to help you think about what you might want to dig into more and ask more questions about. So um, the contents of the report are, you know, similar to past years, but just to remind you, this report contains commercial landings of species in locations where they are not managed at the state or federal level from Maine through North Carolina. Um, and managed means it has a possession limit, a size limit, a seasonal closure, and or limited access. So something like if it requires a permit, but anybody can get that permit, or if it requires reporting of catch, but there's no other restrictions, 
then that doesn't count as managed. It has to have one of these types of management measures. Um, and then we uh, check in with the states every year to make sure that we're accurately reflecting all the state level management measures in addition to the federal measures. And the data, um, so in the past we've got questions about does the data include landings um, to state only permitted dealers? And it does, just to remind you and clarify that, it includes data from the state only and federal dealer reports and um, some information from VTRs, which I'll explain more on the next slide. Um, and then the tables in the report um, include just the species with the top 25 highest landings, all the ecosystem component species from the forage amendment, and then there's two tables to look at trends of increasing landings. Um, and I wanted to make sure to give credit to Sarah Turner at the GARFO Analysis and Program Support Division because she did almost all the work related to the data and pulling together the tables and checking and double checking everything. And she's available online to help answer questions. Um, so this version of the report is the first time that we're using CAMS data. Previous reports use dealer data and there's just a few differences that are meaningful for the purposes of using CAMS versus dealer data for this report. And one of those differences is that CAMS includes what's sometimes called VTR orphans, which are landings that were, are reported on VTRs as retained on a commercial trip but not sold to a dealer. So this could include landings that were retained for personal use or that were used for bait or for some other reason. Um, so this could result in some slightly higher landings than the dealer data, but it, um, Sarah went through and checked what the differences would be for the numbers in this report, and it's only very minor differences um, after the VTR orphans are accounted for, so it, it shouldn't really have any meaningful differences in the report. And another difference is how the, um, the specific species coding system that's used in CAMS, it's a coding system called ITIS, and dealer data used a coding system called NESPP3. So there, there might be some differences in terms of how things are categorized in this version of the report compared to previous years. Um, I mentioned that every year we check in with states to make sure that we're accurately reflecting the state management measures and filtering out things that are managed at the state level in those states where they are managed. So um, this year there's, so we're including data through 2022. So there were some new management measures that came into place for 2022. And so we filtered those out in those states starting in 2022. And that includes measures in Connecticut for a number of species including Tidewater and Atlantic Silverside, Sandlance, Bay Anchovy, and Channeled and Knobbed Welk, and new management measures in Maryland for Panaeid Shrimp. Um, so this is the first table in the report, and I know there's a lot going on this slide here, and you probably can't digest all this information, but I'll walk you through some of the key points here. Um, this table shows the top 25 unmanaged species by weight landed during 2016 through 2022, um, I, this slide only focuses on the most recent five years, 2018 through 2022, to fit it on the slide better. Um, but there's 2016 and 2017 in the report itself, and they're listed in descending order of average 2016 through 2022 landings, and the confidential data are not included in the averages. Um, I wanted to <clears throat> point out a correction that was made on this slide, but um, compared to the report that's in the briefing materials, so um, skates, I crossed it out here because this was something that was impactful related to using the ITIS codes versus the NES PP3 codes. Um, I, th I think what happened here is that there's multiple NES PP, no, that might be backwards, multiple ITIS codes under one NES PP3 code. So after looking at it more carefully and making sure the right species were accounted for, um, this should be taken out of the report because it, um, is a, it's a managed category. So just, just wanted to point that out, that the briefing material, that row should not be there, and we can correct that moving forward. And th that just adds on one additional species at the bottom to keep it at the top 25. Um, so some highlights from this table are that blue catfish continues to have the highest um, unmanaged commercial landings. It's, it's been in that place since 2019. Um, and it was in the top 10 species every year from 2015 through 2022. Um, we didn't look back farther than 2015. Um, some states have programs to encourage harvest of this invasive species, so probably a good thing that we're seeing at the top of the list here. 
Um, blue mussels had the highest unmanaged landings each year from 2015 through 2017, and they were also in the top 10 species every year from 2015 through 2022. Other species in the top 10 um, from 2015 through 2022 include unclassified whelks slash conchs, hagfish, and smooth dogfish. This is the same table. This is um, table two in the, the briefing document, which is the same thing as table one, but it's only for finfish species. So it um, takes out things like algae and shellfish. And basically what this does is it just adds on a few new species. So if you, since it's focusing just on finfish, everything um, from harvest fish on up was in the previous table. And so everything below that is new to add on to this table, um, focusing just on finfish species. Um, the next table shows the ecosystem component species, which are those species that are subject to the possession limit that was implemented through the unmanaged forage species omnibus amendment. And as a reminder, that's a 1,700 pound um, trip limit that applies to combined landings of over 50 species that were designated as ecosystem components. Um, so there's a lot of species, you know, that covers a lot of species, but most of those species aren't landed or they're not showing up in the dealer data. There's some species in there that we, I don't think you would necessarily expect there to be landings of, um, but these are the species that do show up in the, um, the CAMS data. And, um, you can see that there's um, a lot of confidential data. There's several instances of no landings, and a lot of these landings are pretty low overall. Um, there's possibly increasing landings of some species, such as Atlantic silversides, which is the second row there. But those, I mean, I look at those amounts, and I think they still look pretty low overall. And that's the species that, over time, some states have added management measures for, um, like Connecticut starting in 2022 was um, the most recent one for that species. And also just to point out that some of the groupings here could include um, non-ecosystem component species or some nanner species based on how they were, are reported. So for example, there's unclassified herring and um, unclassified squid on the table here. Oh, there was another um, point that we clarified on this slide compared to the briefing materials where the common names, there was two species just listed as squid, two rows that just said squid, but we looked into those codes and clarified that the, the First one listed on the table is squids in the family Lollaginidae, and then the second one is unclassified squids of unknown family. Um, the next slide is just a um, figure um, focusing on some of the species with the higher landings from the, the ecosystem component species. So again, you can see maybe there's some increasing landings of Atlantic silverside. Um, other species are kind of moving up and down, but um, overall, I think those landings look pretty low. Um, but, you know, it's up to you all to, to discuss what you think is important and what constitutes a trend that you might want to look into more. Um, the last two tables in the um, document um, are intended to look at signs of developing fisheries. And there's um, two ways that we go about looking at that. And the first one is to look at um, changes in rank order over time. Um, and so the intent behind this is to look at things that are um, kind of like can make um, big movers. Um, so we use the analogy of like the top 40 songs and, you know, sometimes they highlight like the species jumped up 10 spots or whatever. Um, so this is a way of looking at that. So we have a table that focuses on the species that have consistently increasing or stable rank order over time. And then the next table looks at consistently increasing landings regardless of whether the rank order changed and some of those that make it onto that table but not the other one they might have more steady increases but maybe they're not jumping around uh, a lot compared to the other species so this table shows um, just those species that had increasing or stable rank order um, from 2018 through 2022 um, that includes blue catfish striped mullet atlantic cutlass fish green crab spotted sea trout american pompano Octopus, mummy chug, clean triggerfish, marbled grouper, northern quahog, and unclassified sea bass. And then this is a figure just focusing on some of those species um, with the higher landings um, in that table, excluding blue catfish because those landings were so much higher than the others that it made it hard to compare. Um, so you can see, you know, maybe there's some increasing landings of striped mullet and Atlantic cutlass fish. Um, and the other species have lower landings comparatively. 
And then this table is the species that had increasing um, landings every year from 2018 through 2022, regardless of how their rank um, changed. So a lot of these uh, species also showed up on the previous table. Um, uh, things that are in this table, but not the previous table are sugar kelp, false quahog, and razor clams. Um, and you can see there's a lot of confidential data and some zeros and, um, you know, lower landings for some of the things that are shown. Um, and then, so last year during the discussion, there was a question of um, for the species that are showing increasing landings over time um, from one of those two methods that we looked at it, are they showing up in states where they weren't really showing up before? So are are there, maybe this is, could be evidence of if the species range is expanding and that's creating opportunities for new fisheries um, to try and look at that um, in terms of where are these landings occurring. So we focused on just the species that made it into one of those last two tables. Um, and again, some of the amounts seemed pretty low. Some of them had confidential data. So we decided to focus on just those species that had at least a million pounds of landings in at least one year. And that um, narrowed it down to blue catfish, striped mullet, and Atlantic cutlass fish. We decided not to dig into blue catfish further because, again, that's an invasive species. So we didn't think the council would be concerned about increasing landings of it. Um, striped mullet, Sarah looked into the states where those landings are occurring. And they're nearly all occurring in North Carolina. So there didn't seem to be evidence of you know, noteworthy changes in where those landings are occurring. Um, and Atlantic cutlass fish. Most of those landings are occurring in North Carolina and lesser amounts in Virginia. Um, and for both striped mullet and cutlass fish, there were some landings in other states, but they seemed like very negligible amounts and you know, not anything that we thought was noteworthy in terms of you know, providing any evidence of directed fisheries um, starting in new states where they previously were not occurring. Um, but that's all we had for this presentation, um, and we're happy to take questions. Um, and uh, if, so depending on what you want to know, we might need to dig into it further later, or we could try to answer it now. And again, Sarah's on the line to help out with questions too. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. Uh, I have a quick question. The landings in North Carolina, is that above Hatteras, below Hatteras, or the whole state? Can you break it down? Um, so my understanding of, I'm not sure, Sarah, I might be able to uh, answer more specifically, but my understanding is that for the, um, the state only dealers that it's Hatteras North and then anyone with a GARFO permit, that, that's how it used to be in the dealer data. I think we had it in the reports. I don't know if it changes with CAMS, um, but my understanding was that if there's a GARFO permit, even if they're landing, south of Hatteras, it still gets incorporated. But if it's a state only dealer, it's only north of Hatteras. But others can correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not totally confident in that answer. That's correct. It's the same dealer data that's being brought into this system. It's just being incorporated with the DTR trip data as well. All right, thank you for that. Mike Pentney. Quick question. On the second slide, you talked about how you defined managed. Some, somewhat limiting and I was just curious about that because I think like none of those criteria that you mentioned apply to the bluefish fishery but we would never say the bluefish isn't managed so I'm just curious about how you're how you're filtering species that's a good question we did filter out all um, species that were managed by any council or the commission um, or nymphs um, so, species, you know, blue, a species like bluefish would be filtered out for that reason. But if there's a state-only fishery um, that, again, we didn't want to include something if it's like anybody could get a permit and there's no limit on how much they could catch. Um, that was the intent behind that. Okay, and then maybe just a follow-up. So I think one thing that strikes me is that if we're Saying, for example, so Connecticut has some some regulations that now filter out some of these species, but the same could have been said for, um, I think it was blue line tilefish when we took action to 
manage blue long tilefish. There were regulations in Virginia, but there weren't, weren't in other states. And we started to see landings in New Jersey, spike in New Jersey and some other states. And that's sort of what prompted the council to take action. So I just, I'm just wondering if we're being a little bit too restrictive in, in excluding species from what we're looking at simply because one state may have measures but we're not recognizing landings that may be starting to spike in other areas. Um, we, we are filtering it out only in the states where they're managed. Um, so if like Silverside, for example, if it's managed in Connecticut, but not some other state, um, the landings in that other state where they're not managed would show up. So the code is specific to each species and state. Chris Beth Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Julia and Sarah, for the uh, for the report. Um, in past years, uh, gray triggerfish uh, were showing up, at least I think in the maybe the top twenty-five or one uh, species that uh, continually showed an increasing trend. And I didn't see them anywhere uh, in, in this year's uh, tables. I was just wondering, uh, uh, were, were they picked up uh, by some other states for management or this uh, other just didn't didn't make the the top twenty five uh, th this year. Um, if you give me a second, I can look it up in the spreadsheet. But it it wasn't a species that we heard from states that there were new land new measures this year compared to previous years. But um, I'll I'll check the spreadsheet and see what I can say. Okay, good. All right, thanks. And, and just a, a follow up comment on, on striped mullet. Um, yeah, and uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate you asking about the, the North Carolina landings because uh, Sarah Winslow and I were talking about how, how, that, how that was, um, you know, how the difference between the statewide landings and what was presented here. And that makes perfect sense if, uh, if it was uh, just state permitted dealers north of Hatteras. Um, you know, because it's definitely lower than statewide landings. But uh, just, just FYI, that, that will probably be coming off the list for North Carolina uh, when we see this next year because uh, we are putting in measures to uh, implement a closed season uh, later this fall, like you know, November and December, uh, to um, address overfish, the overfished, overfishing uh, status of, of striped mullet. And I suspect uh, uh, more management will follow up after that. Then, then we'll be able to just see what's occurring outside of uh, North Carolina and the Mid-Atlantic region for striped mullet landings. Thanks. Dewey? Yeah, can you put up uh, slide 12? So, uh, slide 10, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Julia. Um, I have an answer on gray triggerfish. Um, the landings in 2022 were 2,262 pounds. Last year was 2,997. Um, so it, it does look like the landings um, maybe were a little bit higher in more recent years compared to um, years before that. But I, I guess they just didn't um, make it. They weren't big enough to make it into the top 25. And it, it's not showing a consistently increasing trend. Chris Moore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Julia, there's a, uh, you had a slide on Atlantic silver sides. And kind of, I can't remember what your point was there. So we're asking the council something relative to silver sides, but I'm not sure what. Thanks, yeah, I was, so this figure shows um, the dark green Atlantic Silverside landings appear to be increasing, but you know, still below like 80,000 pounds per year. So it's increasing, but is that a big enough amount that the council is concerned about it? I would think not, but I'm not really sure. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there that like this is something that um, we don't really have like a strict definition of like this is the threshold above which we're concerned, the council is concerned about it. We look at things like, you know, what's 
what's increasing and changes in um, where the landings are occurring if there is one, but we don't really have a, a, a known threshold level of landings that kind of indicates like, yes, the council is definitely concerned about this now. So I just wanted to point out that it seems to be increasing, but to me looks low. Chris? So I guess the logical follow-up question to that would be, when do we freak out about Atlantic Silver Sides? Right? Who, do we, who do we ask to figure that out? So is it a judgment call from the folks around this table? Is it, you know, track it for another couple of years and see if it continues to go up and then react at that point? But, and I, yeah, obviously, you know, we don't have to figure it out today, obviously. But, you know, I think just in terms of what we need to plan for in the future, we probably should get some folks focused on this particular question and figure out what to do. Any more questions around the table? Any questions from the audience? Michelle Duvall. So I guess maybe to Chris's question about, you know, thinking about what putting together some criteria that might say, okay, you know, what's, what's the process if we, you know, what should a threshold be? What's the process if we reach some threshold for, you know, one of these species? Um, and then who's the group that would, that would do that? So unmanaged forage was slightly before my time, but I mean, was, I'm just thinking about chub mackerel. So was it the MSB committee that Kind of tackle that, or did we have a separate committee that uh, that worked on this? Good, Chris. I think it was a separate committee, Julia. Right? Wasn't it ecosystem and ocean planning? So that would be that would be the likely committee just to uh, to talk about this again. Maybe something we talk about with our SSC as well. Any more questions? John here. Mr. Chair, just a question. I would imagine that Atlantic Silverside has not landed in any federal fishery. I know that would be the case, but that would be a supposition that I would make. Um, so, but the MID could still consider managing it if it's not landed in federal fishery. Oh, yeah. Um, through the forage, so these species on the slide here are all ecosystem component species through the forage amendment. And for each of those, we had to um, specify a link to federally managed fisheries. And I don't, it, it's in the amendment. I don't remember off the top of my head what the link was with silver sides. And it could be a link either they were caught in a federally managed fishery or there was um, like a threshold definition of important prey for a federally managed species so they, there had to be some connection there but and it, they do have this possession limit through the forage amendment but it only applies to people who have um, federal permits so and I think that's something to keep in mind with a lot of these species that there are a lot of you know a lot of these are in state waters and they're not in federal waters so there's like a limited overlap with the federal fisheries um, so I, I think you know through the forage amendment it's only if you have a, a federal permit and you're also fishing where you're going to catch these species are you is there really an impact from the the measures implemented through the forage amendment and presumably any measures that the council would consider in the future a uh, follow-up um, would the council consider trying to work with asmfc to develop management around a species like atlantic silverside which and my supposition is, is it's only occurring in state water. Chris? Maybe. So we, you know, obviously we work with ASMC on a number of things. And certainly if at any point in the future, 
Atlantic silver size, it became an important topic for us to worry about or be concerned about. And if most of the silver size being harvested were coming from state waters, then in fact, we would work closely with the commission to, uh, to address that. Um, not, you know, I don't, I don't think this is an issue for us anytime soon, but certainly if that did pass, we'd certainly be working with the commission. Thank you. Any more questions or comments for Julia? Seeing, oh, Michelle Laval. I might regret this, but I guess, you know, maybe something to think about for next year's implementation plan might be a tasking of the EOP to think about exactly what Dr. Moore just outlined and some criteria for, you know, or at least thinking about a process for, you know, what do we do if we see landings continuing to go up and sort of how do we tackle that? Adam Nowalski. I think if we're going to task the committee with a task like that, it should not be species specific. It should be setting a general criteria for what we're looking for on things moving. Yeah, if not, we're going to pick every item to death, if not. Any more questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Julia. Let us go to our next agenda item, advance notice of proposed rulemaking, National Standards 4, 8, and 9 guidelines. Dr. Tara Scott, we'll give you a minute to get your presentation up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Council members, for allowing me to come and present today. Um, on May 15th of this of last month, um, National Marine Fisheries Service published a Federal Register um, notice about potential updates we're looking to consider for national standards four, eight, and nine um, of the guidelines. <clears throat> so as you are all intimately aware, our fisheries are facing several ongoing challenges, including changes in our environmental conditions, shifting distribution of fish stocks, and equity and environmental justice considerations. These challenges affect fishing communities that are currently or have been historically dependent upon the resource, which suggests a need for us to revisit the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act national standard guidelines to ensure that they are remaining appropriate to meet the current uh, fisheries management challenges. <clears throat> Next, I have this. Next slide. Um, so the main objective of the ANPR is to determine if actual updates to the guidelines are warranted um, to actually improve federal fishing management. Our goal is to provide the public with background on the specific issues under consideration and to seek meaningful input on specific areas that may benefit um, from revisions um, as appropriate to guidelines four, eight, and nine. So I'm going to break out my trusty blue book. If you want to follow along, I'm going to read uh, the national standard for eight and nine guidelines, just so that everyone in the general public is also aware of what's required. So for those following along, page 58 and 59. So under national standard four, conservation and management measures shall not discriminate between residents of different states. If it becomes necessary to allocate or assign fishing privileges among various United States fishermen, such allocation shall be A, fair and equitable to all such fishermen, B, reasonably calculated to promote conservation, and C, carried out in such a manner that no particular individual, corporation, or other entity acquire an excessive share of such privileges. Under National Standard 8, conservation and management measures shall, consistent with the conservation requirements of this Act, including the prevention of overfishing and rebuilding of overfished stocks, take into account the importance of fisheries resources to fishing communities by utilizing economic and social data that meet the requirements of Paragraph 2, 
national standard two, in order to A, provide for the sustained participation of such communities and to the extent practicable, minimize adverse economic impacts on such communities. And then national standard nine, conservation and management measures shall, to the extent practicable, A, minimize bycatch, and B, to the extent practicable, or to the extent bycatch cannot be avoided, minimize the mortality of such bycatch. Also on page 59 is 301B um, that requires the Secretary of Commerce <clears throat> to establish advising guidelines based on those standards um, for the development of fisheries management plans. These guidelines are periodically reviewed and, if appropriate, revised. So the last time that National Standard 4 was revised was back in 1998, and National Standard 8 and 9 were revised back in 2008 just to give you a little background. So the AMPR focuses on two main um, challenges, the first one being uh, climate-related impacts on fisheries and the second promoting equity and environmental justice. So I'm just going to give a broad brush summary um, for climate, sort of the changing ocean conditions are affecting the location and productivity of fish stocks. Um, as well as the fishing industry's interactions with bycatch, protected species, and other ocean users. Um, these changes can cause social, economic, and other impacts to both the fisheries and the fishing-dependent communities that rely upon them. As a result, these fishing industries and coastal businesses can face significant challenges in preparing for and adapting to these changing conditions. Um, NIMS understands the importance of updating fishery fishery management in order to address current and anticipated needs and conditions. Um, those include things like dynamic stock conditions and other changing ocean conditions. So under the equity and environmental justice, um, this is a huge priority um, for the current administration. And NEMS is committed to advancing equity and environmental justice, including the equal treatment opportunities and environmental benefits for all people and fishing communities while building on our continued efforts and partnerships with underserved and underrepresented fishing communities. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on the interplay between the national guidelines and these uh, two main uh, challenges. So under national standard four, environmental changes are affecting and will continue to affect uh, stock distributions and abundances made abundantly clear in this morning's or this afternoon's presentations. They have the potential to change the applicability of historical and current regulations. Most allocations, not all, but most allocations by the councils and NEMS are highly complex and are supported by extensive analyses. Determinations of many, again, but not all, of the existing allocations have relied heavily on documented catch or landings during specific time periods. Um, considering the documented catch uh, in the development of allocations um, is really important to help participants maintain access to the res uh, resources that they have depended upon. However, it is also important to consider the needs of other users, such as new fishermen who would like to enter the fishery, fishermen displaced from other fisheries, and or existing fishermen who are catching new species in their historical fishing grounds. NIMS is considering whether updates to National Standard 4 guidelines would help encourage allocation decisions that would balance the needs of the different user groups when creating and updating allocations, including for stocks that are shifting or have shifted their distribution. Um, therefore, we're requesting specific input on the approaches for balancing historical uses or historical users, marginalized individuals, who may have been uh, inequitably uh, excluded from historical allocation decisions and also new users um, in such allocation decisions. We're also looking for whether the guidelines need to be revised to help reinforce the 2016 allocation policy that requires the councils um, and NIMS to complete periodic reviews of such allocations. And then, uh, Last on the slide, um, the types of documentation, analyses, and alternative approaches that could be considered um, when making allocation decisions. And by this, um, for example, spatial allocations between sectors and gears, mixes of uses, and other dynamic um, allocation schemes. 
So under National Standard 8, um, looking through the climate lens, as I've already mentioned, environmental challenges are affecting and will continue to affect stock distribution and abundances. And it's going to continue to create challenges for communities that are dependent upon those resources. NEMS is requesting comment on options for updating National Standard 8 guidelines to better account for these changes and to improve the ability of those communities to adapt to the changing conditions. NEMS is also specifically requesting comments um, for options on updating National Standard 9 to better account for and to adapt to changes and in interactions between fisheries and bycatch or protected resources due to the environmental changes. Now switching over to the second major challenge. So under the National Standard 4 guidelines, NIMS is requesting specific input on whether the guidelines need to be updated with additional guidance on approaches to improve considerations of underserved communities, previously excluded entrants, and new entrants in the allocation decisions. Again, we are also looking for information on the types of documentation and analyses that should be considered to ensure that the allocation decisions are fair and equitable. We understand that allocation decisions are complex and controversial, especially given the history, the tradition, and the financial exp expenditures um, that current fishing participants have on a given fishery. So we are requesting input on the need to adjust for future allocations, existing allocations, or both. So NIMS is uh, <clears throat> under National Standard 8, NIMS is committed to serving stakeholders um, equitably by engaging underserved communities in the science, the conservation, and the management of the nation's fisheries. We're considering a few different options um, with respect to equity and environmental justice under National Standard 8 guidelines. We're looking at the definition of fishing community within the National Standard guidelines um, and requesting comment on two aspects of the definition. Um, so I'm just going to quickly read the actual definition that I'm referring to. So Magnuson has a specific de definition and our guidelines add on to that um, through our interpretation. So under Magnuson, it reads, fishing communities means a community that is substantially dependent on or substantially engaged in the harvest or processing of fishing resources to meet social and economic needs and includes fishing vessels, owners, operators, crew, and fish processors that are based in such communities. The National Standard Guideline goes further and says, a fishing community is a social or economic group whose members reside in a specific location and share a common dependency on commercial, recreational, or substance, subsistence fishing or directly related fishing dependent services and industries. For example, boat yards, ice suppliers, and tackle shops. So again, we're, we're looking at <clears throat> potential changes to the second part of the definition. Um, so one of the things that we're considering is removing the requirement that fishing community members must reside in a specific location. This could allow for fishing communities to be based on a fishing characteristics or fishing characteristics rather than an actual geographic location. One example would be um, charter fishermen that target Atlantic Cod. So the second part of the definition um, that we're looking at, we want to see if um, we need to update to better balance fishing dependence and fishing engagement. As stocks decrease in abundance or shift their distribution, communities will likely need to adapt. This would suggest that we need to move away from focusing management on communities that are historically dependent on fisheries. Um, decreasing a community's dependence on a few particular stocks or fisheries, um, by that I mean diversifying the fisheries that they could access could potentially increase the community's overall resilience. Um, again, shifting from dependence to focus on engagement um, would also suggest um, that coastal communities' economic resi resilience could be improved um, and preserve those communities as fishing communities well into the future. So we are requesting specific input on how to appropriately balance the requirements under National Standard 8 for sustained participation of fishing communities and the need to improve consideration of underserved, underrepresented um, communities that are currently or historically engaged with fisheries. 
previously excluded entrants, new entrants, and then comments on, high, uh, on communities with high level of social or clim climate vulnerability. Um, NEMS is also welcoming uh, input on appropriate measures of both social and climate, climate vulnerability for fisheries communities. So under National Standard 9, um, as you guys are well aware, conflict between fisheries and gear is common in fisheries management due to overlap in geographic areas fished um, or the species caught. Relevant to National Standard 9 guidelines, um, we have a situation where bycatch in one fishery has negative impacts on another fishery, usually through um, restricting limits to mort uh, fishing mortality on the shared stock. So this issue can be further complicated when one or more of those fisheries is actually, that are in conflict are important for an underserved fishing community. So NEMS welcomes input on how the national standard guidelines um, could be modified to minimize bycatch in a manner that is equitable across different fisheries and gear types. And we also welcome comment on ways to better balance the needs of bycatch and target fisheries in a manner that is equitable across different fisheries gear types, especially when one or more fisheries um, is important for an underserved community. So there are other fisheries management issues that are relevant for the national standards that are not covered under those two main bents of climate and EEJ. Um, practicability standards. So National Standard 9 requires bycatch and bycatch mortality to be minimized to the extent practical. Agency uh, continues to assert the discussion on practic practicability um, within the existing guidelines um, appropriately balances the various complexities um, of a federal fishery management. But we are welcoming input on how National Standard guidelines could be further modified to decrease bycatch or bycatch mortality of stocks. NIMS also welcomes ways to improve the guidelines. For example, we're welcoming uh, input on whether the agency should consider adding provisions to address bycatch on an ecosystem-based level rather than a single stock metric, um, potentially looking at implementing provisions for alternative performance-based standards, and potentially looking at increasing provisions to document bycatch avoidance. And then the second bullet, reducing waste. So some of our FMPs include management measures that prohibit the retention of certain fish species um, or sizes to ensure that we're, we're disincentivizing fishermen from intentionally catching those fish. When the regulatory discards are required, it could potentially lead to significant waste. So NEMS is seeking input on revisions to the guidelines that could incentivize the reduction of waste, including use of innovations that decrease bycatch or bycatch mortality, or increase um, use while disincentivizing catch of oversized or low productivity stocks where appropriate. So just to give you a general idea of our timeline, the AMPR was published in the Federal Register on May 15th, a presentation by our director, Kelly Dunnett, um, was presented to the Council Coordination Committee on the 23rd. Uh, staff from the Office of Sustainable Fisheries is presenting to each of the eight regional fisheries management councils throughout June, July, and August. We are holding two tribal seminar or webinars and one national level webinar. The national level webinar will be June 12th from 1 to 2.30. Um, and I have information um, linking to that uh, webinar if anyone would like to hear this presentation again or would like to hear comments um, that we received during that webinar. And if warranted, um, based on feedback from all of the councils and the general public, um, we will begin drafting a proposed rule in the fall of 2023. And I just want to state that the public comment period officially closes September 12th, 2023. So we're hoping that we provide um, ample time for people to provide uh, feedback to us and hoping that you um, will uh, widely distribute the notice um, to your constituents so that we get ample feedback. We want to make sure everyone's voice gets heard. Questions, comments? Dewey? 
Yeah, what definition are y'all using for underserved? It's the definition out of the 13895 executive order. I can read you that definition. Is that the one that was presented in October, I believe it was, in, in our New York Council meeting? Not sure if that was right. the exact one that was presented, but let me read. So for the purposes of, of the AMPR, um, we're trying to be consistent with Executive Order 13985, which refers to population sharing a particular characteristic as well as geographic communities that have been systematically denied a full opportunity to participate in aspects of economic, social, and civil life. These include geographic communities as well as population sharing a particular characteristic such as women and girls, Black, Latino, Indigenous, and Native American persons, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and other persons of color, persons facing discrimination or barriers related to gender identity, members of religious minorities, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgender, and queer persons, persons with disabilities, persons who live in rural areas, and persons otherwise adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequality. Yeah, so in general, it would be all Americans. Well, again, it's going to be relative to those affected and interested in fishing. So it's not necessarily that we're, we're just looking at that broad lens, again, to making sure that um, our resources are for the general public. It is a public resource. Really? And this initiative, as I'm reading here today, is for the tackling climate crisis and inequity and environmental justice, particular to these four, three national standards. So those are, those are, the executive orders are suggesting that we look at revising those, but those are not the ones that we're looking. We're looking broadly across um, the challenges that we are facing today. Um, and anticipate in the future and making sure that, again, the public resource is being used and we have national standard guidelines that can address um, those current or anticipated needs. Do it. I don't know if I'll be giving comments or not, but I'll just pass along. When you look particularly to the commercial fishing industry and you look up and down this coast, we're downsizing like crazy, we're going away. I don't know what part I fit into that as far as uh, environmental and equity and justice part. Uh, I've been waiting for five months for an appeal for IBQ bluefin tuna quota that I've not received. I don't know if that is part of uh, under this equation, but for the commercial industry it is, is contracting like greatly up and down the coast and folks are not being able to afford where they're living, not be able to afford dock space. Um, boatyard bills are going out of craziness, the prices of the doing business. So I, I would hope that somehow that the administration and this initiative will look at just everything that has to do with the commercial fishing industry and others uh, uh, given the outline that y'all's targeted audience and also would include uh, uh, the American fishermen, uh, I think would be a great, because we're going away and we're going away fast and we're producing and harvesting seafood for all Americans, not just a few. And, and if we're going away, it would be nothing but increased regulations or increased uh, imports from other countries do not have the conservation friendly minded made to be as a US fisherman does. So I hope that you will take all, all this in encompassing uh, with a, a positive outcome for all Americans and people that enjoy this resource, uh, consumer, both recreational 
uh, fishermen or, or the public at large. Thank you. Thank you, and I hope you would um, provide official comment. Chris Moore. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Chair, uh, thanks for the presentation. Could you put your slide up regarding the timeline, please? So um, I think folks are aware that the CCC discussed the ANPR and the timeline at the recent meeting a couple weeks ago, and there was some concern relative to that public comment period closing on September 12th. And in fact, uh, there was a request that we extend or get an extension on that uh, deadline, and the answer was no. Uh, but the CCC ignored the no and still passed a, mo a motion that said we'd like an extension to October 15th. And the conversation related to the fact that these national standards are pretty big, heavy duty national standards, and we're going to need some time to really think about them. Uh, this is the, our cut, the initial cut, this council's initial cut at what we might want to say relative to those national standards and the possibility they may be revised. But, you know, we'll have another chance in August if the council wants to talk about it again. And I think it probably would be a good idea for us to prepare a letter as well uh, to send into uh, the agency relative to um, possibilities here. As I understand it, it is just a possibility. The NPR is just, you know, the, uh, announcing to the public that there is a possibility that we'll get involved in revisions to these national standards. But what what are the thoughts? And I think I I think I know the answer to this question. But what 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 are the thoughts relative to if in fact we move to proposed rules or a proposed rule on all three of the national standards? What kind of timeline are we looking at there? Um, again, if warranted, um, we would consider drafting a proposed rule. It would likely not go into implementation until later into 2024. It would, it, this is going to be a substantial effort um, and making sure that you as partners are included in that process. So the proposed rule would come out in 2024 or would be, we'd have a final rule in 2020? No, the proposed rule would probably come out in 2024. And again, that would probably have an extensive comment period associated with it to ensure that we are getting the necessary feedback. Thank you. Adam Nowalski. So as a follow-up to Chris's comments about us possibly having to have to submit comment in August or having those comments come together by the August meeting, uh, I heard Dewey give some very specific comments. The response I think I heard was, I hope you'll submit those comments as written, which suggests to me that what we're saying here today is not going to be, is not being accepted as comment. That's the interpretation I'm getting when I hear comments be issued and say, I hope you'll submit them written, which is fine. That's not a criticism of anyone here today. But what I am thinking is, would it be possible to have a staff member uh, that would help draft this letter and between now and the August meeting solicit potential comments from council members to provide a draft meeting for review at the August meeting? Chris? Yeah, I, you know, short answer is yes. You know, I think we haven't, we, thought a lot about other things that related to timelines and things we're going to be talking about later in the week as it relates to uh, 304F, but we really didn't spend a lot of time at the staff level talking about how to deal with this. And what you proposed, I think, is very reasonable in getting some additional folks involved beyond the staff to, to basically craft those comments is a good idea. We have until September 12th. So um, we have council meeting in early August. We could bring uh, basically, <clears throat> excuse me, a draft to the meeting for folks to look at, comment on some more, polish that up, and certainly get it in by the uh, September 12th deadline. Sorry, can I just respond? Um, so Julie's comment is being recorded. Um, I have my colleague who's the lead for the ANPR who's listening in on the webinar who's taking notes. 
um, but Dewey said he didn't know if he was going to provide um, comments. So I just want to make, make clear, I don't want to put words in people's mouth and put it pen to paper and then upload it to the Federal Register. Um, but we do take his comment um, into consideration because this is a public meeting. Any more questions or comments around the table? I'm going to go to the audience. Greg DiDomenico. <clears throat> Thank you, Greg DiDomenico, Lunds Fisheries. Um, you're only doing one national level webinar in June. At this time, that's the only one that's being scheduled. It will be recorded um, so that anyone could up, uh, listen to it at any time. Okay. During that webinar, is it possible you could give us examples of how you might envision your uh, what your goals are and how they would be implemented into an amendment or into um, actual council policy? Because I, I really would like to see what you what the agency thinks will, will achieve their goals. That would be really helpful for industry, for, for people who rely very heavily upon fisheries and have invested and employed people. It'd be nice to know how you're gonna achieve what you want. So I won't be leading the national webinar, but I will take it back to my colleague, Dr. Wendy Morrison, who will be leading that and see if she can provide those details. Just a, uh, maybe one question for Executive Director Chris Moore. Chris, is there some way in your deliberations at the council that we could get perhaps to the bottom of, of that? Um, how do you envision this playing out for the FMPs under your authority? Thank you. So earlier uh, statement regarding this being a big deal stands. Obviously, this would have an impact on all of our FMPs. So when I think about it, I'd step back and say, what are we trying to do with a revision to these national standards? Someone asked to someone, it'd be nice if someone could identify the specific problems that we're trying to address. In other words, what have been the deficiencies with these national standards as we've done our work over the last 10 years? Get the part about, you know, we haven't really looked at them for 10, 15 years. So certainly taking a look at them, but it may be that we comment and say, don't do anything with them. That's a, that's a valid comment. So, you know, depending on how they're revised, um, back we get to that point, uh, they could have a significant, a significant impact on our council FMPs. Certainly, those revisions could. James Fletcher. Glad to see this happening because everything the council has done. Jim, see if you can talk a little closer to the mic. I'm glad to see this happen because everything the council has done has promoted bycatch and the destruction of the commercial fishing industry. United National Fishermen has proposed a keep what you catch for the recreational fishermen, thereby there would be no bycatch. And on the commercial side, we have proposed the same keep what you catch with a dollar value. So therefore, there would be no bycatch. How do we get this out of the council and before the national government? Because the council and NOAA Fisheries are promoting a theory that was put forth by Nixon and Kissinger to destroy the commercial fishermen. So how do we get two things? One, everything the recreational catches, they keep. Two, everything the commercial catches, it keeps and sells. And there's a limit on the dollar value of what they can sell. Thereby, if they do not abide by the rules, their amount of money can either be reduced or reward them and increased. How do we get that before you and away from the council and ASMFC? Thank you. So was he addressing me? 
So I don't think that's something that I can do here with this presentation or with this ANPR, but we are requesting your public comment so that we can ac accurately um, reflect um, those challenges in, in addressing um, the changes to national standard guidelines if warranted. So please provide additional public comment if you would like. Thank you very much, Tara. I don't see any more hands up anywhere. I would encourage all council members, all fishermen, all everybody to definitely provide comments because I don't know a fisherman sitting around a table here that doesn't get scared to death when we hear there's a possibility. I mean, it scares me to death. So everybody provide comments. Thank you very much. Let us go to our last agenda item for today, Council Statement of Organizational Practices and Procedures and Harassment Prevention Policies. Dr. Chris Moore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Stephen or Mary, could you pull up the slides, please? While those slides are coming up, um, there they are. So uh, for the next half hour or so, we're going to be talking about the SOPs. Um, I, there's some folks around the table that haven't experienced those conversations before. The SOPs are our statement of organization practices and procedures. Important for the organization because they drive how we do things. Right? So there are practices and procedures. Um, we um, have behind tab five a number of uh, documents for you to look at. Um, and with specific reference to four things that we're going to be talking about today. Major consideration are the harassment policies. There's two of them that are included in the briefing book. Looked at these before. We included them in the briefing book um, the last, for the last meeting so that you could start to think about them. Uh, they're well done. They're good documents, certainly easy to understand, and certainly uh, um, very direct in terms of uh, what they mean. But what what they are are policy documents that were developed by the National Marine Fishery Service as a result of a request through the CCC. So the CCC in 2019 asked the service to develop these policies. A number of councils have had issues regarding harassment and really needed something like this to help them with those uh, situations. We've had harassment language in our SOPs since we probably had SOPs. But this would revise that language and, and bring it up to date. So um, if you take a look, can I have the next slide, please? So again, the major thing that we're talking about today is the harassment policies. Um, but uh, we thought that we take advantage of the SOP revisions or potential SOP revisions to talk about a couple other things, one being the elections, the other one uh, being how we deal with uh, staff bonuses. So in section 242, we talk about nominations. Uh, we have language that would remove the requirement for at least two candidates for each office. It's language that's been in there probably for 20 or 30 years. And uh, most of the time, we don't have two candidates for each office. So we kind of just ignore that. So this is clean up. Uh, also, uh, our attorney indicated that we should probably address situations with multiple candidates that are tied for the lowest number of votes. And there's some language in there relative to that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk at length about the harassment changes. And last uh, but not least, we'll be talking about language that revises language that we've had in the uh, SOP since 1978 regarding uh, incentives or special act and service awards for employees. So we thought it was uh, time. Actually, I've been thinking about it for a while, and just we haven't had a, a SOP revision to, uh, to deal with it. So again, take advantage of this opportunity. So uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> the, uh, the harassment language, the proposed edits incorporate new anti-harassment language and references to the two policies that I talked about. First policy uh, pertains to council staff. The second policy pertains to council process participants. So that's everybody else that's involved in the council process. Um, the staff policy addresses situations where the employee would be the alleged victim. The council process participant uh, policy provides guidance on addressing allegations experienced by participants in the process, like council members, AP members, SSC members, consultants. The, um, the actual policies are included in the briefing book for you to see. 
Uh, there's uh, some red line changes to those that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, as I indicated, we're talking about these harassment policies as a result of uh, action taken through the CCC. So this, this is a nationwide uh, revision. So all, most all the councils at this point have incorporated uh, these policies into their SOPs, uh, either uh, incorporating the entire policy or by reference, which we're doing. Um, the uh, policies uh, indicate that NOAA and the councils are committed to ensuring a safe working environment for everyone involved in the council process. Those are the two policies there that uh, I'd like to uh, have the council adopt at this meeting. Next. So uh, the policies contain this language, a, a definition of harassment is unwelcome conduct based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, older age, disability, or genetic information, and defines unlawful harassment uh, when it uh, relates to condition of employment or it's severe or pervasive enough to create an intimidating, hostile, or abusive environment. Next. There's a number of key policy elements I just want to bring your attention to. Uh, I'm not going to read the policy documents to you today, uh, but uh, these are the two, two very important ones. Uh, council will not tolerate harassment or retaliation against those who report harassment. Um, and the second bullet there, individuals who experience or observe harassment are strongly encouraged to come forward to ensure a safe working environment for everyone involved in the council process. There's some other elements as well. Next. Um, the documents detail how um, we deal with harassment. If, in fact, there's a situation that occurs at the council, um, it talks about who and how reports are made. Reports can be made to the chair, the vice chair, the executive director, or some other designated point of contact. Uh, the executive director is responsible for initiating an inquiry. Um, the, the procedures uh, related to that are very detailed. They're in the policy document for you to look at. I'm not going to read those to you. And uh, also, it, it, it uh, it indicates that non-council employees, like state employees or academics, can report within their own organization. But we also point out that they should report that to the council as well, since it's really the council, related to council activity. Next. Other key elements include these bullets here. All participants have responsibility to prevent harassment in the council process. Those subject to harassment or observing it should report it as soon as possible. Uh, appropriate action should be taken after an inquiry. And also, this last one is something that we've done. We've taken some additional training related to harassment. Just been some identified in the policies, like council members, like you all, are required to take uh, periodic training. Next. So if, um, if you take a look at the language in the tab, just quickly, I'm going to pull it up exactly what we're talking about here. So we'll get to the nominations, election stuff, but if you look at uh, employment practices, you can see how we've handled the reference to the policy documents that uh, were produced by NIMS. Um, we modified those slightly. So you see in 412C, um, the language that I've talked about, uh, which is basically the council will not tolerate harassment or retaliation, is on. Um, and basically, you can see what we take out, which is the old language. Then again, uh, these other points, including boys are strongly encouraged to report any incident. Some of the other language, again, referencing the policies as attachments. So by adoption of the policies and adoption of the language, then we'll consider those incorporated, those policies, without actually putting them into the SOPs, but be part of the SOPs. Does that make sense? So with that, um, harassment is uh, something that we need to address as a council. Uh, thank goodness we haven't had many harassment issues over the years. It's not been a problem for us in recent years like it has been for some of uh, the other councils, and I hope we never will have to deal with it. But if, in fact, it becomes an issue, we have a well-developed process detailed in these SOPs and in these policy documents that will guide us. 
So I'm going to stop there and ask if there's any questions and then move on to the other items. Any questions or comments about the policy or the language in the SOPs? Adam? Thank you very much for these efforts. Uh, so having gone through multiple trainings and multiple venues in this, there were two elements of this that I had not seen before that were somewhat surprising and just looking to hear some explanation why it's right for us. One with regards to the definition of older age, specifically putting a number in there and not just referring to age-based discrimination, period. You could discriminate against someone because they're on the younger end of the spectrum. Uh, you could discriminate against someone based on age because they have a particular distinguishing feature that may be associated with what people would perceive as younger or older. So I'm curious about that. I'll stop there. I'll let you address that, and then I'll ask my second question. Thank you, uh, thank you, Adam, for the question. It's, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting question and an interesting point. Um, to back up, these policy documents were not developed by us. They were developed by lawyers working for the Department of Commerce and NOAA to basically um, deal with the, the issues that councils might have to address. Why it says older age there, I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that, but I think, you know, I could ask our attorney and John has something, something he can talk about. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a labor attorney, but my understanding is that the way that these are drafted, um, they're looking at legally protected classes of people that are the harassment based on those, um, legally recognized bases is, is what this is addressing. Um, when it comes to age, there's statutory protections for people on the older side, not the younger side. So that's why you see that number there and up, not down. Chris? So my super duper policy expert says that it comes from the definition in the Age Discrimination Employment Act, an employment act. So it's what I think you said. Adam? Okay, so again, my I think my point still stands. It sounds like there's some agreement. I don't know if there's any other place in this document to say, hey, we are not going to discriminate on age, period even though we have to have specific requirements to meet other legal definitions. Don't know if we have any options anywhere else or if there's support for that around the table. Uh, the other element here is with regards to reporting, reporting of the incident to executive director, chair, or vice chair. Where I've dealt with these types of trainings, there's usually some type of uh, organization designated officer for dealing with these type of things, uh, with the concern trying to essentially uh, protect leadership as well as give a member or whoever an opportunity to know there's someone who's outside of the process to address that, who's not intimately involved, that I think in most all of our actions, all three of these individuals are. Uh, so I understand, you know, I don't know. We, I don't think the council is in a position to go out and hire somebody else uh, to do that job. Uh, I don't know if that's a service provided by the service that would cover all of the other councils. Uh, and I think my comment here is, is there something else again that we would have whereby there's some way for issues to be addressed that would be outside of leadership for both parties' protection. Chris? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the short answer is yes. I'm looking, I'm scrolling through the policy to find the exact language. It basically encourages uh, council employees to report any incidents of harassment to the appropriate uh, NOAA official. Going through 
the document. First thing to your first point, it says in here uh, under 401A, preferred point of contact to coordinate responses to harassment allegations is the executive director. So that's very explicit, right? And then it says the executive director will identify a second point of contact. Well, look something up real quick. Basically, the way that the policy is set up, it would allow for this uh, second point of contact. So I could identify someone else within the organization and be another person that folks could go to. So uh, given the fact that we only have 14 people, I'm not sure who I would point as the second point of contact at this point, but good. My point, I think, is that it's in the best interest of the council and any interested parties to know that there is an uninterested party that could be involved in addressing these concerns. And and I would point out to back up that this says that I will identify a second point of contact. So even so, that's something I have to do once we adopt these stops. Other questions or comments? So we can do one of two things. We can stop here, see if the council is ready to adopt this portion of the proposed changes, or my preference is to go over the other possibilities and look at the entire thing as one package. So if that's okay with you all, I'll go back to other possible changes to uh, the SOPs. This other document here. So let's let's deal with 242 nominations. Uh, if you look at the language under 242, actual uh, document says the chair shall appoint a nominating committee uh, who shall make its nominations. And then medical said at least two for each office. And we strike, we basically would strike that relatively easy straightforward change. The next one is related to elections. And um, if you take a look at the language there, it's the language blue, it says if there are multiple candidates tied with the lowest number of votes, they shall all be dropped from, uh, from consideration, unless this would result in less than two candidates remaining, in which case the candidates tied with the lowest number of votes shall draw straws to determine one candidate to be dropped from consideration. And this is language that was proposed by John. In case we ever found ourselves in that situation, I think it's reasonable. It says the process will continue until a candidate receives the majority of the vote cast. Neither of the final two candidates receives the majority, there shall be another vote taken. But after three votes without a majority determined, the final two candidates shall draw straws to determine the winner. So I don't think we've ever been in this situation, the hypothetical potential exist, obviously, depending on how things go in the future, but um, it's a reasonable language and I think it's a good change to, uh, to uh, that uh, section. Any questions or comments on nominations, elections? Chris Pat Savage. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just uh, curious on the decision for drawing straws over coin flip or rock, paper, scissors, best two out of three or something like that. <laughs> Um, I'm sure there's probably one more objective than, than the others. It's just, just random curiosity. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, flipping a coin was my first thought, but I thought, what if there's more than one? Then we're going to have a tournament of coin flips. So I figured draws, draws is the safest. And last, 444, Incentive Special Act and Service Awards. And um, this is uh, basically uh, relates to bonuses. And it says, incentive awards are designed to motivate employees to increase productivity and creativity by rewarding those whose job performance and ideas benefit the council and are substantially above normal, normal job requirements and performance standards. Um, it says cash awards for outstanding service may be granted to full-time employees at any time during the year. 
Uh, and then it says a cash award may be granted in any amount ranging from $25 to $5,000. That amount, $25 to $5,000, has been in there since 1978. So I asked my trusted economist, what is $5,000 now? Or what is, what is $5,000 in 1978 worth now? He says somewhere around $25,000. So, um, you know, not that we would give awards of $25,000, but just giving you an indication of it's time to change this language. So um, basically what uh, we're proposing is that the amount of, of the award be determined by the executive director within the budget constraints of the council after consultation with the chairman. And the total amount of a cash award will not exceed 10% of the employee's base pay, which is uh, very similar, as I understand it, to how the, the uh, the federal government works with uh, some of its bonuses. There's additional language there. So um, from my perspective, a relatively straightforward um, change to uh, the SOPs, I think uh, it makes sense. Certainly it would open up, I would open it up for any questions or comments at this point. Is any of the, any of the changes? Adam? So I'm not asking for names or amounts. I'm just wondering how common that incentive award is um lower amounts common higher amounts uncommon so i have used i do use bonuses and have used them in the past um uh, most of the councils have a bonus system uh, like i indicated federal government does it as well I'm not sure about state governments, but I think there may be some bonuses, especially with at least some of the state agencies. So, yeah, it's not it's not common to award large amounts of money for bonuses. Any more questions or comments for Chris? I see none, but. I do we believe we have a motion that we can put up. Would anyone like to make this motion? Sarah Duvall, I mean Michelle. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's it, we have. You guys are going to tag team it. Who would like to go first? All right, Michelle first, and we'll do Sarah second. Michelle, would you like to read it into the minutes, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move to adopt the draft harassment policies and approve the proposed revisions to the SOP. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions, comments? Would you like to provide some rationale? I think the executive director covered it, but, you know, I think we, he's, this particular set of policies has been around for a while to be updated and modernized according to uh, the legal eagles who have put together these policies. Um, so it's appropriate that at this time we move this forward. Yeah, 45 years is a long time to have nothing updated. I think hopefully we can pass this by consensus. Is there any objection to the motion? Any abstentions? Seeing none, motion passes by unanimous consent. Do you have anything else to bring before us? So, uh, yes, thank you, Council, for that. I appreciate uh, getting that done. And I think the uh, National Marine First Fishery Service would, would like to have all the Councils adopt these policies, and I think we were probably close to the last group. So they'll be happy to see that uh, we did that today. Um, given that, I think we're done with with all our business, I'm going to turn to Shelly to tell us what's going to happen after now, like what happened beginning now relative to 
hospitality was skipped later today. Unless, so I need someone to tell us time where the bus meets, money part of it, those kind of things. Kelly. Plenty of parking skip. All right. Don't walk. Don't walk. Yeah. 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 All right. With that, that's we are done. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Anybody hear that? With that, we're done with our business items for the day. We will see everyone back here at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you.